All right, so take out a piece of paper. And all I want you to do is write down what the two chapters we had to read for tonight were. All I want you to write down. Just what the names of the two chapters were, roughly. One for today that you read, because part of the syllabus says that you will read the chapters before each class. Correct, Louie? Okay. So, let's see. You're not writing anything, meaning you didn't read the class. Read it. Hey, Tom. All right. Okay, Tom. Pop quiz. Literally, pop quiz. Yeah, you might want to watch out. It's water over there. Okay. Write it down on a piece of paper. Okay. Now, for those of you not writing, for those of you who are, good job. We'll go. We'll. We'll. I'll, I'll give you the credit for doing for doing that writing that down correctly. In a second, for those of you who aren't reading it, you have to read the chapters before the class begins. And I know there's lots of chapters and there's lots of reading. That's why I'm not giving you that much homework, right? Because I want you to read the chapters. So we don't run into problems where you have no idea what I'm talking about and we're trying to, like, I'm trying to get you ramped up like this, right? You need to, like, have a slower ramp up. You read the chapter ahead of time and then do that. Okay. What'd you write down? Gravity and space. Gravity and space. Okay. And then what was, what was the other one? There you go. Fluid dynamics, as we call it. What'd you write down? Projectiles, angles, gravity. It was about like, you know. That was last time. Oh, projectiles. Sorry. You're right. Nope. You're right. Projectiles. Angles. Yeah. Good. All right. Good. You guys did it. Who else got? Who else wrote down the right chapters? I, I just wrote down a four or five. Do you know what they were? Yes. Yeah, so okay. I, I don't want to. You write down, down the right. I write actually. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. All right. Tonight was four and five. Tomorrow, or for Friday, Saturday's class, it'll be six and seven, right? It's like two chapters every class, which really means by next Monday, it's also eight and nine. So that's like a hundred and some pages of reading, right? It's a lot of reading, but that's why I'm not giving you that much homework so that you have a chance to do this. Like knock out like 30 pages a night, just or during the day or lunchtime or whatever, okay? This is why you probably can't share a book because you need to get your own book to, to be able to you know, do that. Yeah, I yeah, just really can't because you've got to do the reading. Yeah, Tom. What we experienced today, that would be fluid dynamics. That would be like hydrodynamics. It would be both, fluid and hydro, yes. Okay. Today, for, for the benefit of the tape, we had a very, like a massive flood and like thunderstorms and the heavens opened up today. So, yes, yeah, I would say that was very important. There was a lot of erosion. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I tell you what, for those of you who did do the reading or wrote this down, I'll give you bonus credit. So at the end, remind me and say, I did it. I know who didn't. Now I know who didn't. Um, did I, have I made myself clear about next time? Maybe we'll have an actual quiz where I ask you like some of the details. But the thing is, I don't necessarily want you to concentrate on all the details for this because that's what we're going to go over here. And I want you to get a, just an overview of it. You know, and maybe go, oh, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me, why? And then think, and then when you come to it in class, you go, ah, that's what I was thinking of. So there we go, okay? All right? Or I could just start assigning massive amounts of homework, which none of you want. <laughs> All right, so here's, whoops, here is what we were supposed to read last night. Some of you guys did, okay, or for today. And by the way, I'd read it all too. So I mean, I know what you have to do to actually get it in there. Now I've seen most of it before too, <laughs> but um, for what it's worth, that the two things we're going to talk about today: um, different topics, but as you may have noticed so far, a lot of this stuff builds on itself, right? So it build, builds on the previous stuff, which which kind of too bad some people are missing tonight um, because uh, their their clues flooded, which is bad, but. Um, that's also why I tape this so that you can watch the video if you do miss a class. And I know, the clues, <laughs> clues are flooding. Um, anyway, uh, the point is that uh, 
the, the stuff builds on each other. So gravity and fluid dynamics seem very different, but you'll find out that gravity plays a pretty big role in fluid dynamics when we get to that. Okay. All right. And with gravity, we're also going to talk about, uh, as uh, Brank said, um, we're going to talk about projectile motion, which is kind of cool and kind of interesting stuff. That's not when you throw something up and down. It's when you throw something at an angle and it goes in that nice parabola. And uh, we'll talk about how to figure out some things with that. Okay. All right. The universal law of gravitation. Who was the guy that sat under the apple tree and figured this stuff out? Isaac Newton. Now we've already talked about Isaac Newton's laws before, right? Isaac Newton was a um, brilliant guy. One of his big thoughts that he, that he figured out was that an apple falling from a tree is the same, is the reason it falls from the tree is the same exact reason that the moon travels around the earth. And those two things seem very, very different. And in fact, when he came up with them, they also seemed very different to everybody else in the world, but he realized it. Now, the apple story may or may not be true, but for, for what it's worth, that's, that's the story we have. And they are the same ideas, okay? And we'll talk about what that's all about. Here's what the, well, here's what the, all the people in the ancient times used to think, okay? They used to think that stars, planets, the moon, were heavenly bodies that didn't have anything to do with the earth and matter, and they didn't connect the two at all. Okay, they thought everything that happens on earth is completely separate from what happens up in the sky. You know, you can believe it. I mean, if you're not, you know, if you don't know this stuff, why wouldn't you believe that? But that's what they, they thought. Newton came along and he said, aha, turns out the moon actually quotes, falls around the earth, okay? And what that means is if it were to, if it were to uh, go in a straight line, that's kind of the falling motion that it has. So I drew it on the board the other night. I'll draw it again today. The moon at any one time is going in a straight line absolutely perpendicular to the earth. Okay, so it's, it's going this way, but it actually ch changes its direction, it accelerates, it changes its direction because of the gravity of the moon, okay? So the moon maintains this thing we call a tangential velocity, one sec time, tangential velocity, which means perpendicular, okay? It's always going perpendicular to the Earth. Yes? Now, is the moon on an axis as well? Does it rotate? Interesting, interesting question. Does the moon rotate? The moon actually uh, has stopped rotating. Okay, that's why we always see And that's why we always see one side. You, call, you know the dark side of the moon? Okay, the real, that's because the moon has actually stopped rotating. We'll talk, probably talk about why that's the case when we get to astronomy. Okay. But for what it's worth, it's been affected by the Earth's gravity for so long that the, the Earth has pretty much locked it in its position. And by the way, the Earth will eventually, I think millions and millions of years from now, um, do the same sort of thing with the sun, where it's kind of going to lock into position where it won't turn anymore, which will be interesting. <laughs> but met millions or maybe billions of years from now, a long time. I don't think any of us will be around at that point. But you never know. Maybe we'll come up with the uh, fountain of youth or whatever it is. No, go ahead. Questions are great. Would the sun's heat being concentrated on that one side of the Earth cause the temperatures to rise? Would the sun's heat because concentrated on one side? Probably. Well, the other side would freeze. Like it's not dispersing yeah. away. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep, absolutely. But yeah. Solar heat, not like heat. Well, well, next chapter is temperature and heat and all that, and we'll get to what the, what those terms. But yes, um, from the standpoint of uh, you would not want to live on the other side. Let's put it that way. It would freeze. You'd freeze. Dark side of the earth, right? Okay. So anyway, we're gonna we're gonna delve into this a little bit, a little bit more. All right. First things first. Well, and this will actually take a couple slides here. Okay. Cover your eyes a little bit. There's a little bit of math. But this is really, really important. Every body in the universe, everything, whether it's this pen or it's you or it's the sun or it's the earth or it's Pluto or whatever, attracts every other body with a force. And that force is what we call gravity. Okay? And it's, we, again, we don't understand why that's the case. We just observe that it is the case, that everything that we C, matter-wise, attracts everything else. Okay, it's kind of cool. Um, what, 
Newton figured out was that this is the actual formula that that attraction is based on. Okay? We talked about this term the other day, directly proportional. Does everybody remember what directly proportional means? If two things are directly proportional, when one changes, that's exactly right, when Tyler said when one changes, the other changes in the same direction, really. It might not be equally, but yeah, I mean, I guess it is equal proportions, certainly, directly proportional. So the force is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to, this is a different one for us now, the square of the distance separating them. So what that means is that this actually, you can look at it here, the force is equal to some constant which we won't worry about quite yet. If you take the two masses, multiply them together, and then divide by the distance between them squared, that will give you the force. Okay? So that means that if, you're, if, you're, if you go from two meters away to four meters away, you go from a factor of four to a factor of, what's four squared, or, or rather, that's not the way to think about it, sorry. You go twice as far, which means you're going to get how much more? Double. Actually, it'll work. Mm, actually not, twice as more gives you four times as much, right? You go from a factor of four to what's four squared? 16. 16. The difference is four times bigger. I didn't pick the, oops, I didn't pick the best examples here. but. Let's try a different one. If you go from, if you go from ah, one meter and then you pull something away to five meters away, one squared is what? One squared equals one. Five squared equals 25. So you go, if you move something five times farther away, it's 25 times less force. Okay. So that's, that's what happens when things go farther away from bodies. Now, what this, here's, here's what it doesn't mean. If you're talking about the Earth, here's the Earth. And here's you standing on the Earth. You guys see that? Standing on the Earth. How far away are you from the Earth? Zero. Ah, Tyler says zero. But that would mean we'd have zero force. You actually don't measure it. You center, measure it from where? Yeah, you measure it from the center of the Earth to your center, which is like right around your belly button area. And that distance is like 4,300 miles or something like that. Sea level? Right? Uh, at sea level, roughly. But really, the difference between sea level and the highest mountain is like, what, three miles or four miles or something like that? I mean, it's, it's not that much, right? So really, the distance here is not that much. Remember how we said that Satellites are about 200 miles above the Earth, the, the ones that are, uh, the ones that are uh, like the space station and so forth, and the space shuttle. The difference between 4,300 and 4,600 isn't really that much. So guess what? On the spacecraft, there's the same amount of gravity there as when they're on the Earth, almost. We'll get into why they actually feel weightless in a, in a few minutes. Okay? But the point of this is, Again, here's the, here's the formula that runs gravity in the entire universe. It's the force times some constant, which we'll get to in a minute, times the mass of one times the mass of the other divided by the distance squared. And by the way, if one of these masses is the mass of the Earth and the other mass is your mass, you, what is the force of gravity if somebody else comes along and has twice as much mass as you? What happens to the force? It doubles. If, it's, if you're twice as much, if that becomes twice as big, wouldn't the force become twice as big? Yeah. Well, the force is twice as big because your, the mass got twice as big. We're not talking about changing the Earth's mass, but if somehow the Earth's mass changed, that would also change the force. Okay? All right. So that's the formula. Okay? I'm not going to make you do many calculations with this. If I do, they'd be really easy. You could do them on a piece of paper, not in the calculator. Okay? All right. Now, as I said, this is the universal law of gravitation. And Newton's the one who figured out that everything pulls on everything else. Okay? So key, key concept there, that everything 
pulls on everything else. And by the way, there's no pushing in gravity. That would be really cool if there was. You could somehow have anti-gravity where things are pushing, you can do it. Now, nice thing is that we can do that electrically or we can do it with magnetism or that sort of thing, but can't do it with gravity. Okay. At least that we know of, but you know. Okay, we already kind of went over this. This is, this is graphically showing that if M1 and M2 are bigger, you get a bigger force of gravity. If the masses are bigger, you get a bigger force of gravity. And the distance separation is if the, big, the farther away you go, the less force of gravity there is. So as you get farther away from the Earth, it's less gravity. Do you ever get far enough away from the Earth that you can't feel the Earth's gravity? That's not a good way of putting it. Do you ever get far enough away from the Earth that the Earth's gravity doesn't have any effect? No. No, you everything always... Yeah, everything always has... So right now, you're feeling the gravity a tiny little bit, well, actually a big, a big amount from the Sun. You're feeling a tiny little amount from Jupiter, an even tiny, minuscule little amount from Pluto, an even tiny, tiny, tiny amount from some stars that are way far away. But everything has some amount of gravity that's affecting you right now. So does this pen, so does the computer, so does Tom's hand. Yes? It, this is why people created astrology and that is a good dates and everything like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Tom, Tom says, hey, that's, isn't that why astrology comes into play? To an extent, yes. So I am a firm non-believer in astrology, which I hope most of you are as well. But um, astrology is just saying that the stars actually affect you. But the amount is so minuscule that nothing we can yeah. use to measure would even come close to measuring that stuff. That's a good point. Yeah, it's part. Of, I. It's probably not why this this isn't pro, this probably isn't why astrology started. I think astrology started a long time before. Yeah. But it's it's ammunition that astrologers use to say, oh yeah, that, that's because our stuff makes sense. But which in certain dates or you know x amount of constellations or the right, sky at that right. point. Exactly. That, that sort of stuff is, uh, yeah, a little crazy, but, you know, people believe that. Okay? All right. Okay, we already went over this, too. The inverse square law is this whole idea that twice as far away, four times less force. Three times as far away, nope. What's three squared? Nine, Nine times less. A hundred, well, what's, how about this? Seven times farther away. 49 times less. Just square the distance, right? Okay? All right. And this is what we just said. No matter how far away you get, never quite reaches zero. Okay. Oh, we've already gone. I, I wanted to hammer this in <laughs> to you guys, the whole point that... Um, so here's the question. If the, if the masses of... Ah, this is actually, this is actually not, not quite the same. This is the, this is the inverse square law, but what does this one say? If the masses of the two planets are each doubled, the force of gravity does what? It actually, it actually is quadruples. Okay, and I think it's on the next thing here. Yeah, let's look at what that means. The force is this constant G we'll get to times the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the distance squared. The only thing that changes in here are these two. And if this one became twice as much, and this one became twice as much, what's two times two? Four. four. That means that the force would become four times as much. Okay? These are the kind of things that we, that you want to be able to think about when I, when I talk about it. So this is kind of a trick question. Not really, but it's kind of a trick question in saying if both masses somehow doubled. Okay? Which probably isn't going to happen, but you put two Earths together, something like that. Okay. All right. Now, here's this thing called G. Now, this is a different G than the lowercase g that we used before. Okay. Here's another pop quiz. Don't get this wrong. Think about this before I'm gonna before you answer too. Nobody blurted out. What does little G stand for? No, no, no. Don't say that. And that's wrong. It's not the force of gravity. What does the little g stand for? Don't, don't, don't say it. Just, just think it for a sec, and then I'll let somebody answer. Because I want you all, guys, all you guys to think about it. Because I, I mentioned it the other day, and you all went, okay, okay, I won't, won't get it wrong. 
Okay, everybody thought about it? You got something in your head about what this means? Okay, Nicholas, what is this? There you go. It's the acceleration due to gravity. That's what little g stands for. Okay, 10 meters per second squared on Earth, roughly. Okay, all right. This or grams, yes, but no. You're right. That's that's a different unit altogether. G is the actual variable. This one is uppercase G. Okay, and what it is is it's that part that we put in there to say. How much does the masses and divided by a distance squared relate to the actual force? What's the actual number? Okay, like, like how do I figure out the actual amounts? Now, it's actually what we call the proportionality constant. Okay, all these terms have a proportionality, or a lot of these formulas have a proportionality constant. What that means is that you multiply by that number to get the actual weight, okay, or force between the two objects. Remember how I said that gravity is a really weak force? Like it's not a very strong force. I mean it, it holds us on the ground, but it's pretty easy for us to jump off a little bit off the ground just with our tiny little muscles, right? Okay? And the reason we know that is because we, when we calculate this constant, we see how small it is. We're not going to really go into too many details about scientific notation. But can anybody tell me what I would have to write if I didn't want to write this in scientific notation? Yeah, 0. 0.00000000000. I'm not going to get the right number. 6, 6, 7. And that should be, let's see. So for 6, 6, 7, so it's going to be 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I got it. There you go. Okay, that's how big that number is, which is really, 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 really small. Which means that in order for the force of gravity, which is on one of these previous slides here, in order for this force right here to be measurable, if this is a really small number, and your mass is pretty small, this is you, your mass is small, so this is small, this is really small, really small, the distance is kind of big because we're thousands of miles from the center of the Earth and it's squared. And remember how that makes this number really small? Small, well, big. This is big, but it makes things, but makes it small, the force. What does the earth, mass of the Earth have to be in order to make so that we feel it? Big or small? Big. Has to be huge. Okay? Louis, look at me like my head's spinning. Yeah, if your mass is tiny, and this is a big number, and this is really tiny, the only way this is going to be measurable is if the mass of the Earth is huge. Okay? So, and by the way, the mass of the Earth is huge. It's like 10 to the 24th some kilograms, right? Which is huge. Okay? So, scientific notation is kind of crazy. So, it doesn't really matter how big is the distance? Oh, it very much matters. It, the, the question is... The question is, well, well this, is, this, this figures into the whole force, right? And we said that this is going to be like, it's going to be like, um, what did I say, 4,000, about 6,700 kilometers, right? Which is actually 6,700, 6.7 million miles. But it's still denominated, though, whatever the force is going to be, it's still small. It's gonna, this is going to make it even smaller, yes. Oh, okay. This is going to make it tiny. Your mass doesn't make it very big. This number G makes it really tiny. So we're only counting on the mass one. We're counting on the mass of the Earth to make it work. And by the way, the mass of the Sun is even more huge. Okay? Maybe we'll calculate, maybe we'll look up, oh, we don't have internet access. I was going to say, maybe we'll look up some of these masses and figure out how much the Sun. You think the Sun pulls on you more or less or the same as the Earth? Less. Less? pretty far away. It's 93 million miles away. So maybe less? Yeah, it actually pulls on you a lot more, <laughs> believe it or not, than the Earth. But the reason is, um, what's that? Why? Because the mass of the sun is huge. Yeah. And you know what? I better check that. I'm going to check it. When I go home tonight, I'm going to check it and see how much, how much it is. And if I'm lying to you, I'll tell you on the next one. But I'm, if I, I seem to remember that the sun pulls on you actually a lot more than the Earth. 
Now, why don't you go flying off? Well, because you're going around the sun, right? And it's this orbit thing we'll get to in a but second. What makes it the planets stay on its path? Good question. We're going to get to that. But, yeah, actually, tell you what, instead of me just doing it right here, we'll get to that. And that's a very good question. So, so it's exactly the same thing. Kenneth says, wait a minute, what makes the planet stay on the path? We will get there in a few minutes. So there. Yeah, Tom. And the gravitation and the moon affects the tides, right? And that's a whole other part of the picture, but uh, but it, yeah, that that's also because of gravity, obviously. Okay. Would you mind turning the AC on? It's getting a little warm in here, I think. I thought it was just me. That's why you. No, it's pretty. I know. What's that? I just they're not working. That one might be off too. Or, or it could have died because of the water, but. That one working. Okay. I'm good right now. Thanks. There we go. There we go. All right. Somebody probably came in here and turned off. I know, probably. Yeah, this Christian becomes probably. Oh, he probably came in. Yeah. yeah. All right. What was your question? Is the Earth tilted because the moon is pulling on it? Is the Earth tilted because the moon is pulling on it? No. The Earth is tilted because it happened to when it got either caught by the sun or whatever, ended up in that orientation, twisted. But I'm glad you guys are asking all these astronomy questions because it's going to be you're going to love astronomy when we get to there in a few weeks. Okay, let's talk for a minute about weight and weightlessness. Okay, and when I say weight, maybe that's why that was off because it's loud. Oh, there it goes. It heard me. It heard me. We'll see. Um, got any? Got any? Cool from there. All right. We're going to talk about weight and weightlessness. Sorry about the formatting on here. I don't know what happened here. Weight. We have already gone over this a couple times. Okay. Your weight is the force that's exerted against a supporting floor or a weighing scale. In other words, when you stand on a scale, the measurement of the force on that scale is your weight. It simply comes from the gravity, gravitational pull of the Earth on your body, okay? Except that you have to be standing there to actually feel it. And that's going to, we're going to get to that in a minute. Weight is the force exerted against the supporting floor or scale. If the floor just disappeared, let's say for some, let's say I'm, well we can use the elevator example. If you're sitting in and standing in an elevator and it's at 100 floors up and somebody snips the cord and it starts falling, do you feel any more weight on the floor? You actually don't. Your feet come off the floor a little bit. You get that weird pit in your stomach, and then you, you know, realize you're going to die, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because that pit in your stomach is like right now. Your stomach and all your muscles are basically holding up. I guess your muscles are kind of holding your organs up a little bit because right now there's gravity pulling down, and they don't slosh to the bottom of your, you know, gut, right? So they're being held there. So your body gets the feel for that, okay? And you do that when there's no thing to push against. You don't feel that anymore, okay? Weightlessness is not, let me start out with what it's not. Weightlessness is not the lack of gravity. It's not the lack of force pulling down on you. It's the lack of the support below you. And this is going to be really important when we get to why you feel weightless when you're in a spacecraft. Okay? Again, it's not that there's no gravity, although you can go somewhere in space where it feels like the, the average of all the gravity is zero. But that's not here. Okay? In fact, that's nowhere that, that really the average is zero. But weightlessness is this feeling you get from having no actual thing to push against. Okay? Free fall is a good example. If I drop the pen, while it's in free fall, it doesn't have a feeling of weight. It just kind of feels like you know you drop. Anybody a parachutist or anything in here? Tell people. Actually, par have you done free fall? Yeah. Yeah. When you free fall, you, the instant you jump out of the plane, you get that pit in your stomach and you feel like you're falling, and yeah. then eventually you stop feeling that because you hit terminal velocity. It's, it's pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So here's weightlessness. If there's no support force, okay. If you go off a cliff, or if you're sitting as an astronaut outside your spacecraft, or even inside your spacecraft, okay, you feel weightless because you're not supported by anything. 
okay? Your body feels like there's no gravity because you're so used to a support, okay? And that's what gives this feeling of, of weightlessness. Remember how we said that on the space shuttle, here's the Earth and, and here's the space shuttle up here, the distance between the center of the Earth and the ground and then the ground and the, this is actually not even to scale, it's much, much farther to the center of the Earth than the distance above the Earth that the spacecraft is. There's still plenty of gravity there. The acceleration due to gravity in a spacecraft is like instead of 9.8 or 10, it's more like, it's more like, I don't know, 9.2 or something like that. I mean, it's still plenty of gravitational force, but you don't feel that for the reason we're going to talk about. Okay. All right, we got those in your brain right now? I got a question. Yeah, question. So if you're on the moon and you're on the bright side, the Earth is going to be pulling on you away from the moon, right? So Careful. It's the yes, but why isn't it on the other side? You're still there, right? I was going to say on the other side, it's still pulling you, but would you weigh more on the dark side of the moon than on the bright side because it's pulling? Ah, very good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so, uh, so Tyler says, hey, look, here's the Earth, and here's the moon up here, and if you're standing on the close side of the moon, you're being pulled this way by the moon and this way by the Earth, right? right. And then if you're on the other side of the moon, you're still being pulled this way by the Earth, but now you're being pulled the same direction with the moon. So yeah, you would weigh a little bit more. Yep, good call. Good call. A little bit. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. So if the Earth is rotating, wouldn't that same thing apply when we're on the Yes. So yep. we weigh more at night? Uh, let's see. Weigh more at night. Oh, because of the sun, you mean? Uh, slightly. Slightly, yes. Okay. All right. Um, because you're, although that said, you are actually a little farther away from the sun. Hmm. So that's a good point. Hmm. I don't know. It's a good question. Whether at night you weigh a little bit more because you're pulled in the same direction, but you're farther away by six thousand meters or something, or six thousand kilometers, or eight thousand kilometers. True. True. Hmm. Good question. I don't know. I have to, we'll have to figure it out. I'm not sure. You can try. You can try to figure it out. Yeah, you can sit there and figure it out. Now, because the Earth is spinning, there's other issues involved, too. Like, there's a little bit of, you would ask the other day if centripetal force is what keeps us on the Earth. Centripetal force is uh, a little bit of what keeps us on the Earth. The rest of it is gravity that makes it so we can jump up and down. But we'll get to that in a little bit, too. This was the um, elevator example I kind of mentioned before. Is everything all right with the... For now. For now. <laughs> all right. Um, so if you are, if, if we'll call this Sally, if Sally is sitting in the elevator and it's not moving, okay, or actually if it's moving at a constant speed, it can still be moving, but if it's at a constant speed, she's at her normal weight, okay? If the, ex if the elevator is accelerating upwards, okay, and gravity's pulling down, you actually get a combination of effects here, and she actually weighs a little bit more if it's accelerating upwards. You're pushing down on the scale more. As the elevator's slowing down, getting slower, right, or going down, accelerating downwards, she actually weighs a little less. And then if you break the cable, she's not too happy because she weighs zero. And the scale, everybody kind of floats around in the, in the uh, elevator. Okay? That's it. Mythbusters did a, did a cool, like, cut the cable thing. They wanted to know if you could jump up right at the right moment and keep yourself from dying, and they said, no way. I think that was the answer. So yes. One sec. From Nicholas. Of the curiosity, what, what would her weight be upon hitting her uh, Well, her, her weight would, well, would it would be, you, well, yeah, I mean, then you're talking about a collision. So the weight would be, yeah, I mean, it would be really, really, it would probably be pretty That's intense. Probably, probably be pretty intense, yes. Yeah, Tom. So how did they figure that out in the experiment? Oh, uh, they actually found some place that was going to get rid of its elevator, and they cut the cable and had the little dummy that they use, and they, they figured yeah, out the force. Yeah. They, they didn't have somebody do it, no. So how did they have it jump? Uh, I forget. Springs, maybe? I'm not sure. Yeah. Either that, or they just measured the force and were like, forget it. You can't jump. They knew how hard you can jump, and 
it was uh, it was interesting. But I'll you can look that one up. Yeah. Okay. So that's. Does go the ahead. Way to the atmosphere on you affect your weight? Ah, we'll get to that. Okay. Does the weight of the atmosphere affect your weight? Well, we will get to that in the next chapter. But part of it, part of the answer is that it's pushing on kind of all sides of you. Now, right on your feet, it's not because there's no atmosphere down there. But for the most part, um, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. Well, that's a good question. Does it increase your weight? I don't think it increases your weight because it's pushing kind of on all sides, but um, not 100% positive. Okay, now we're going to talk about, so that's gravity, and that's really all I want you to know about that formula and all that. And You should be able to say what an inverse square law means, and you should also be able to say, look, gravity is a really small force because of that tiny little constant big G that we have in there. Okay. Projectile motion is what we're going to get into next. So far, we have talked about throwing an object up in the air and then having it come down to the ground. And we did all sorts of you did all sorts of um, experiments last night in the lab with acceleration, where you get these nice cool graphs and things like that. Remember that from last night? Well, we're going to talk about what happens when you actually throw an object in a path where it goes in that parabola, like a baseball or a football or something like that. Like a boomerang? Boomerangs are a little different because they actually, they actually will, they don't really fly in a parabola so much. They do to an extent, but then they come back and they've got lift and it's definitely more intense. Yes? That's the same with a yeah. gun too. If you shoot a uh, bullet perfectly straight and drop a bullet, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll land at the same time. You're stealing my thunder, man. <laughs> no, that's fine, and keep that in mind. Tom has the exact right idea. We will get to that. One of our check questions will be that, but but that's what we um, that's what we will talk about. And by the way, we're going to start by talking about objects thrown horizontally, like that. So they like on a big cliff, and you throw it directly sideways. And what does it do? Which is exactly what you're talking about. We're just talking about a higher up sort of thing. Okay. All right. This stuff is kind of fun. I wish we could spend like two weeks on this. Right, because it's kind of fun and there's lots to, to calculate and whatever, but I'm not going to make you do that. Okay? All right. So the projectile, which is throwing an object out into space, forget about air, we're not going to worry about air yet. Okay? Projectile actually curves as it goes out. Okay? But it's a combination of two separate ideas. And this is the part that you gotta you gotta let yourself believe that there's two separate things going on. The first thing is that the ball has to, is being affected downwards by gravity, right? After one second, it's at five meters below the cliff. Two seconds, it's at 20 meters. Three seconds, it's at 45 meters. Remember all those calculations we did last week? And at three, four seconds, it's at 80, I think, 80 meters below. It's accelerating, like we've talked about. Sideways, though, let's say you throw this at 10 meters per second. After one second, how far away do you think it is? It's not five meters. So there's no gravity sideways. Good, good idea, but it's no gravity sideways. Notice the distance between here and here and here and here and here is exactly the same. And it should be. That one doesn't look quite the same, but it should be exactly the same. Because sideways, is there any forces on it sideways? No. Except for air, which we're going to ignore. There's no sideways forces on it. An object in motion stays in motion at a constant speed if less acted on by any force. Forget about the up-down one. It's the side-to-side -side one we care about. And the side-to-side -side one has no force on it. Therefore, after, if it's going 10 meters per second, after one second it's gone how much sideways? 10 meters. And after two seconds, 20, 30, 40. OK, so do you see how these two effects, if you take them both together, will follow this path? It's because the downwards is so much, but it's gone the same amount over. Then it's gone down this much, but it's only gone the same amount over. And it's gone down this much, but it's gone the same amount over, and it looks like this cool parabola. Aha. OK, I'm going to show you some demonstrations of this in a minute. Now, this is what Tom actually stole my thunder on a second ago. But that's absolutely fine. The question is, if you have a cannon or a rifle, as Tom said, that shoots a cannonball or a bullet horizontally over a level range, that means like flat, okay, and you also release 
a cannonball at the same time, which one hits the ground first? Yes. <laughs> the answer is <laughs> at the same time. The answer is yes. They both hit the ground at the same time, no matter how fast you shoot the bullet sideways. Okay. From the tower, except yes, except that. So Galileo did two objects from the tower, but he dropped both of them. If he had also thrown one of them sideways, they also would have hit at the same time, which is really, yeah, which is weird. So when you are, okay, here's here's a little thought problem. You're at the sh you're at the rifle range, okay, and you're in your prone position, and you're only about what a meter above the ground. Let's say you're on one of the raised ones and you're a meter above the ground. Okay, If you're a meter above the ground and you want to shoot a target like 300 meters away, do you have, does it take more than a second to get to that target? No. How do you know the answer is no? Well, it's the velocity, but I wager this. You know because if it took a second how far would it fall down? Let's say you shot it level. Now you're always going to aim up a little bit. But let's say you shot it perfectly level. How far does something fall in one second? Small 10 meters per second per second accelerates. How, what was the distance we said after one second? Five meters. Remember, it's not 10 meters, it's five meters. And it falls, if this was, if this was five meters above the ground, then it would take one second to fall there. It would also take one second for the bullet to hit the ground because they're going to hit at the same time. So that's kind of how you know that it takes less than a second to hit that target. Okay? It's because if it took more, it would have hit the ground. Now, you do aim up a little bit despite what your little sight seems like. You are aiming up a little, so all bets are off. But, but from the standpoint of shooting something directly sideways, the same thing. It's just the same thing if you were to hold a ball here and drop it the instant somebody shot a gun the bullet would hit at the same time the ground, if the gun's perfectly level. With no resistance. With no air resistance. Well, even air resistance in that case wouldn't really affect the up and down too much, to tell you the truth. Okay? All right, so let's look at this interactive figure here, which I think you all have access to from your, from your uh, uh, mastering physics, if you go in there. But let's see, mastering physics. Mastering Physics Chapter 4, Interactive Figures. OK. So let's see. Can't see what all that says. Hang on. OK. Uh, let's see. Orbital trajectories of cannonballs. Nope. Drawing ellipse of string. Nope. Um, projectile and free fall motion. That looks like the one. So let's do that one. Ah, here we go. OK. Can everybody see that? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to launch the blue ball. Okay, we're going to launch the blue ball at some speed. It doesn't, not listed here for some reason. Okay, gravity is going to be on. Sorry, we're going to launch, we're going to drop the blue ball, I should say. The red one we're going to launch directly sideways. And you're going to see what happens here. Bing. Okay, I don't know why it's not listing the speed there, but that's it. Do you see how they both, this one goes sideways. But falls, Eric, you're with us still? This one goes sideways, but also falls the same rate. After, let's say, let's say each one of these dots is one second, even though it's not. After one second, it's gone this, this far, but it's fallen the same. After two seconds, notice how those are right next to each other. Three seconds, those are right next to each other. Four seconds, those are right next to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Let's make the, let's make the velocity a little higher. Again, I don't know. Hang on, let me try something else. Well, if we put the gravity off, that's a little different, actually. But, whoops, uh-oh, hang on. Let's try with this. OK. Let's try it there. Is there gravity in Angry Birds? <laughs> there, is there gravity in Angry Birds? Uh, there is gravity in Angry Birds, yes. Oh, it's still not showing it there. Huh, weird. Well, anyway, I'm going to make the acceleration a little bit bigger, or the 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 initial velocity a little bigger. Notice that it went a little farther this way because it was going sideways faster. Okay, but it still hits at the same time. Because we can do it all the way over the one there, and then same thing. 
okay, no matter how fast sideways you go, it's going to drop at the same rate. Okay? If I took gravity off, I don't even know why they have gravity off here, because the blue ball just stays there. But you can see that it goes the same speed, the same amount of distance each second. Because there's nothing sideways making it speed up or slow down. Okay? All right. So. Yeah, it's pretty cool. OK, um, let's see. Was there another one in here that I wanted to show you? I don't projectile motion. Here's this one. Let's see what this one looks like. Oh, the same one. Wait. It is a little different. It's odd. Oops. Let's see. Ah, come on. There we go. Uh, let's see. Play. Oh, this one's just showing the. Horizontal block. This one's just showing the one ball whoops, versus, ah, versus the other one. Yeah, it's a little different, but it's showing the one, not together. I don't know why, they, I don't know why that matters. OK. All right. So we're going to get into some other fun, um, oops, some other fun uh, ones here in a minute. There we go. OK. All right. There we go. Notice. If you were to shoot a cannon at an angle, what really happens is it goes in this parabola like this. right? When you shoot the cannon, it goes and comes like that. If there were no gravity, it would go this way because there's nothing making it go down, right? Nothing pulling it down. At each little point, it's actually 5 meters, 20 meters, 45 meters. You notice this amount? The amount difference between what gravity is changing versus what it wouldn't if there was no gravity is the exact same as if you just dropped something. Because the acceleration is still the same, and so the amount of distance that things change is going to be exactly the same. So this is kind of a tricky one to, to get. But after one second, it would have been here if there was no gravity. But it's actually fallen five meters from where it would have been. Because when things fall, in the first second, they fall five meters. Because gravity accelerates it from zero meters per second to uh, 10 meters per second. And the average is five meters per second, so it falls five meters in that time. After two seconds, it's 20 meters. After three seconds, it's 45. Hmm, that's kind of cool. Okay, that's kind of cool when you, talk, when you look at projectile motion. Okay? All right. As it turns out, and I'm going to show you another, I think, I think it's on this one here. Yeah. I'm going to show you another projectile one if I can find it. I'm pretty sure I have another one. For equal launching speeds. In other words, I have a cannon. Do you ever, do you ever play those games? Uh, it's like a monkey one where you, or, or a, try to gauge how where you try to gauge how far the, yeah, what, what angle you have to go to do the, to shoot the cannon. You try to hit somebody else's cannon. Scorched earth or something they used to call it. Worms, probably the same. Yeah, is it the same thing? You try to, you try to do that? The what? Scorched Earth was one of them. But that was a long time ago. So it turns out, if you shoot something really high or at a really low angle, and those two angles add up to 90, notice 75 and 15 add up to 90, they land at the same place. Okay. 45, there's no other angle that's 45. And guess what? 45 goes the farthest. This is all without air, by the way. And then there's other ones, too. If you do 60 and 30, guess what? The 60 goes up here and lands there. The 30 goes here and lands there. If this class involved trigonometry, we would figure out why that's the case. OK, but Louis' head would explode because it's more math than <laughs> we're going to do right now, right? So you would be fine. You would be fine. But, but the point is, we're not going to go into the details. But the, the reason it's 60 and 30 and 75 and 15 and adds up to 90 degrees has to do with trigonometry. And that's how the launching goes. OK, so let me go back to, pretty sure we can do this now. Let's see. Dr. Elliot, can you explain it to you for about six hours? Six days? Oops, this one, this isn't it. We'll get to this one in a minute. Um, 45 degrees is not the optimal with air resistance. It's actually something like 50 or 47 or 49 or something like that. Okay, so here you go. Here's the little example here. 
Anybody see that? All right. OK, if I shoot it at no air resistance, if I shoot it at 60 degrees, and I can also make it go down to 45 or 30 or whatever. If I say 60, watch. Boom. Goes like that and hits right there. Okay. If I do 30, right, it also hits the same spot. Okay. If I do 75, these ones don't explode, I guess. Well, most cannonballs don't explode, do they? They just take your head off when they hit you real hard. 75 goes a little bit more. And it's all about like if you're raising the angle up too far. Right? It spends more time going up and down than it does side to side. Okay? Same thing with 15, it's the exact opposite. It spends not enough time in the air because it doesn't go up high enough. Right? But the optimal in this case is 45 because then it spends the perfect amount of time in the air up and down and the perfect amount of time side to side. So that's why the 45 goes the farthest. Okay? All right, um, let's see. I think it's going to erase my tracks here, but let's try 45 with air resistance. You think it's going to be farther or less far with air resistance? Less or I hope so. There we go. Oh, a little bit less. Okay, there you go. And I don't know about, I think, whoop, now it did delete it. But oops, sorry. I want to put the air resistance on. That's 60 without air resistance. Now it's going to be 60 with air resistance. Yeah, a little bit less. Let's see what happens if it does, see if it does 30 with air resistance. There we go. 30 with air resistance. They say 30 with air resistance goes a little farther than 60 with air resistance. Maybe it's because it spends, less time. I don't know, less time. Oop, what, what happened there? Uh, let's see, 45. There you go. 45 is still farther, right? Um, I fr I d unfortunately, you can't change this one to an exact amount to find out what it would be, what the best would be. But it's not going to be 45 anymore with the air resistance, OK? All right. So let's see. Was there another one I wanted to show you with this one? No, I think that's about it right now. Um, I don't have the video right now. Maybe during the break, I'll see if I can download it or something. Oh, I can't. I don't know. Yes? Wouldn't 45 still be the, the best option with wind resistance? Even though, I mean, because wouldn't the wind resistance be the same as, say, 50 or 55? It depends. If the. It, I think it's a little bit. I think it's a little bit less than 45. Actually, I think it's a little bit less because it's maybe because it doesn't go up as high and it doesn't have to. Like the wind doesn't have more as much time to affect it or something like that. I don't. I don't exactly know. So but there's a special. Why the, the 30 and the 60 were. Yeah. The 30 was longer. Than 30 was a little longer than the 60. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, going up in the atmosphere a little higher, be better air. Oh, thinner. Yeah, but. True, but cannons generally don't go high enough to worry about thinner air. <laughs> Good point, but they, they generally don't go high enough to thinner air. Um, oh, I was going to say, so there's a video that I, I do want to find at some point. If, it's not a good example. If there was a tree, let's call this a tree, right? And there was a monkey sitting on the branch, OK? There's the monkey, his little tail. He's standing on the branch holding a banana. Right? And you are a, uh, let's say he's not holding a banana, and you have a banana hurling gun. Because you don't want to shoot him, right? But you want to shoot at him with a banana hurling gun, right? So here's your little gun, and it shoots bananas, okay? And you're going to aim at the monkey, okay? If you want to, if you want to, if there was no air resistance or whatever, and you aimed directly at him, right? You'd hit him, let's say. Okay? Let's say that he, was, he was in the right place to hit him. Question is, where do you have to aim if at the exact same time, uh, is that the question? Wait a minute, I've got to get the question right here. Above Well, hold on. The question is, if the monkey, let's see. Yeah. If the, let's, let's do it this way. Let's say you're far enough away. Uh, let's see, does that make sense? Yeah, let's say you're far enough away that your, your gun will actually go like this. You're aiming straight at him. You're aiming straight at him, right? But your, your, your banana throwing gun goes like this, OK? Like, let's say you don't, it's not good enough to hit him, right? Where do you have to aim 
if he's going to drop at the exact same time you shoot the banana gun at him, or the banana at him? That's the question. Do you have to aim higher, lower, or exactly the same? If he's going to drop. Like let's say he lets go of the let's say he lets go of the branch and you still want to hit him with the banana. Right? You fire at the same time. Yeah. You fire right when he drops. As it turns out, Bobby's absolutely right. What happens is he will fall the same distance as your banana falls, even though it's going up and down. Remember, it changes the same amount of distance. So if you aim right at him, actually, this is, a, this, this is kind of how it works. If you aim right at him and he doesn't drop, you'll miss him because it goes below him, right? But if he happens to drop right when you aim at him, he will drop the same amount of distance as your banana changes its uh, velocity. It's, his velocity will change the same as your banana does, and they end up hitting right in the middle. And you can set up this whole experiment where it does it. I'll show you the, if I can find it, I'll show you the video of um, what that's like. I might have to find that. I might have to find the video a little later, like for next, for next week. We could try the baboons, yeah, and see and make sure they drop at the exact same time. You shock them right when they drop at the same time. Okay, all right. Uh, let's go back to here. Oops. There we go. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into, oh, it's actually 6.15. Tell you what, you want to wait till after, cor after colors so we don't run into colors down there? Okay, let's just go a couple more on here and then we'll get a break. We're going to now talk about satellites. And we mentioned this before. Okay? You okay, Kenneth? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll give you the break. I just want to wait till You know what time colors is tonight? Is that okay? And we can take a break now if you want. Okay, we'll just wait five minutes. Satellite. Oh, five more minutes. There you go. <laughs> All right. Satellites are these ideas of things going around, orbiting around other things. To become an Earth satellite. In other words, if you want something to become a satellite around the Earth, the projectile, because it's still a projectile, it's still going out, the projectile's horizontal velocity, in other words, sideways velocity, has to be great enough so that it matches the curvature of the Earth. This is a little, this is kind of interesting stuff, okay? What this means is, if you throw the ball, if you threw, were able to throw a ball faster and faster and faster, we're standing here on the floor, which is made nice and level though, right? The Earth is not level. The Earth actually curves. And if you could throw a ball fast enough, so that every second, the curvature of the Earth was five meters lower. And you could throw the ball fast enough, it would drop five meters, but the Earth would have curved away by five meters. Okay? So let me, let me just see if I can draw that. Yeah, Louie. Okay. So here's the Earth on a big scale curving that way, right? You throw the ball fast enough. You don't throw it fast enough, it hits right there. If you throw it a little bit faster, it hits down here. And we're talking speeds that we can't really throw things because this is a huge amount of distance, right? Okay? Throw things faster, it's going to end up landing there. But what if you threw it fast enough so that it stays the same distance away? It's falling, it's still falling, right? But it's staying the same distance away. Does it ever get closer to the Earth? No. no. If it doesn't get closer to the Earth, it's a satellite, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this, and then we're gonna we're gonna go back to it after the break. Yeah, Tom. Uh, isn't it about 12 miles from the horizon on either ground? It is about 12 mile 12 miles down, I think. Yeah. Okay. You even got, well. On, on the water. Depends how high up you are already, on, but on yeah, water, it's about 12 miles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, this one was, I know I saw it in here before. Uh, hang on, it was the cannon one. There it is. Orbital trajectories of cannonballs. Okay. Whoops, wrong one. There we go. There we go. Oh, no. 
All right. OK, so here's a little cannon. Okay, here's the cannon. And we're going to fire the cannonball around the Earth. If we just drop it, watch what happens. Hopefully you can see it. If we just drop it at 0 0.01 kilometers per second. In other words, not very much. Okay? It goes boom and hits. This one actually exploded for you. Okay? So it does that. If we do it a little bit faster, let's say 1 kilometer per second. Yeah, we've got to get the. There we go. If we do it at 1 kilometer per second, watch what happens. I'm going to reload and fire at 1 kilometer per second. OK. Now, notice it got a little farther because the Earth curved away, too. So it got to go a little farther. Remember, this is on top of a mountain. Isaac Newton made this analogy, by the way. And, and by the way, he thought there was no way we'll ever get satellites because you couldn't do it fast enough. But he didn't know about rockets. So, you know. Okay, let's look at two kilometers away, or two kilometers per second. Oh, not bad, got a little farther. Okay, anybody want to guess how many kilometers per second it's going to be before we, when we finally reach, when we finally reach? Five, five seven, six, ten, ten, five. Let's try five. That seems to be a lot of, a lot of people think five. Reload, fire. Oh, 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 oh. Got about a quarter of the way. 11 to 12? Let's try 11 to 12. Let's try 12. Uh-oh. Oh, look at that. 12 kilometers. The cannonball will escape into space, never to return. We're going to get into what that's all about earlier. Seven? Let's try seven. There we go. Okay, seven. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, it hit the mountain. <laughs> Hit the mountain, yeah, the mountain. Eight. Let's try eight. Let's go, let's go. Is it getting closer? Oh, there you go. Hey, there we go. Eight. All right, now you'd have to move the cannon out of the way, right? Yeah. So that one has right. some real eight meters per second. Okay, which means that the, eight the or sorry, eight kilometers per second. Yes, eight kilometers per second, which is pretty fast. Eight thousand meters yeah. per second. Right, which is what a, a football field's a little more than a hundred meter, or a little less than a hundred meters. So eighty football fields a sec. Eighty, yeah. Eight, eight would be eight hundred meters. So it is eighty meters, eighty football fields a second. That's moving, right? Thousands of miles an hour, right? That's where it is. Now, we'll get to this in a little bit too. I tell you what, we'll start with this. You guys can go on your break. Eight is where it is. Okay, so go on your break. We'll come back in 10 minutes. How about 35? We'll be back. Eight meters per, eight kilometers per second. We'll do that. Can a satellite be going around the Earth? A satellite could go any way it wants, yeah. You could do that. In fact, we do polar ones. We do the other one. Should turn green. Green? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so here's where we left off. We said that it took eight kilometers per second around the Earth to have a satellite in orbit. Eight kilometers per second. Now, you're not going to do that next to the Earth because there's too much air resistance. And Kenneth and I were talking about this earlier during break that on Earth, if you tried to shoot something at 8 kilometers per second, it would almost burn up almost instantly because it would and it'd slow down and it would burn up because there's so much air resistance. But once you get high enough into space, there's no air resistance really. And we can do this without you know, worrying about uh, all of that. So I did want to do a couple more here. Let's reload and say if we do 10 kilometers, let's do 9. 9 kilometers per second. One thing to notice here. What's that? The nine kilometers per second. Notice what's happening here. Is it still in orbit? Yes. Yeah, what's different about it? It's an oblong one. We call that shape what? Oval. Oval's good, but an ellipse is a mathematical one. Oval, oval works. 
but it's an elliptical orbit. And actually, this kind of orbit, as it turns out, and we won't talk about all this stuff, but there's this guy named Kepler who first figured out the orbits of all the planets and how they worked. Everybody thought they were perfect circles. Okay? Most orbits, in fact, all the planetary orbits around the sun are not perfect circles. They're really close. Many of them are really close, but they're not perfect. They're this kind of elliptical orbit. You can still have an orbit that's an ellipse, and it's still going to work as an orbit. But notice a couple things about it. Can you see if it gets slower or faster when it's getting down here? Much slower down here, right? And then when it gets over to the top, when it gets, gets over here, see how it speeds up and it goes whipping around here? Some countries actually put satellites up in, satellites up in these very elliptical orbits. Here's why. If you have a giant country down here, you want your satellite to spend most of its time above your country, right? Well, unless you're the Russians in the 1980s and you wanted to spend most of the time over the US. <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, same idea, though. What you do is you put it in this ellip highly elliptical orbit, and you get lots and lots of time to like do whatever you're doing, watch or broadcast or whatever, over your country, if you, do, if you time everything right. And then, the, and then it's a tiny amount of time over, whoosh, whips around, then you got lots and lots of time. Okay? And that's why we're closer, right? And that's why what? That's there's going there's a summer winter summer. Oh. N no, that is not why we have winter, believe it or not. In fact, during so I think what what Frank's alluding to is we're far we we are in an elliptical orbit around the sun. Most of the year or for the the average distance we are from the sun is about 93 million miles. Sometimes it's 95 million miles, sometimes it's 92 million miles. Like it goes we go that much closer and farther away. But that's not be the why we have the seasons. The seasons is all about the tilt of the Earth and, and how much sun is directly striking the Earth. Um, as it turns out, if you are in the northern hemisphere, where we all still live, we barely live, we're 11 degrees north, right? Right now, we are actually in summer farther away from the sun than in winter. Now, in the southern hemisphere, their seasons are backwards, so they're actually closer, but that doesn't have anything to do with the, the um, distance. OK, so let's see. That was 9. Let's go to 10, and we'll see what happens here. OK, 10. Now, if you'll see, it's even more elliptical. Spends a ton of time. Unfortunately, it goes off the screen, actually. It says it's going to take 24 seconds on this, uh, on this thing, simulation to go all the way around. And you'll see eventually it'll come back. But it's spending lots and lots of time down here. And if you were, wanted your satellite to be over the country for a long time, you might put it in this kind of orbit. And then it whips around the top and then spends all the time going around there. OK, and they're pretty cool. Yeah. And so you, um, that's how you change the, uh, that's how you change, uh, or that's, that's how you make, make it so that you're farther or far enough ben, away. Yeah, kind of. So how does, like, when the space shuttle come back to Earth, like, how do they, they just go through the? Ah, the so that's a good question. So the space shuttle does pretty much one thing. It actually shoots its rockets. It turns around and shoots its rockets backwards so that it slows itself down. Right? It also can change some of the trajectory a little bit, but it just basically slows itself down. And if you slow down, you get closer and closer to that amount where you're going to actually hit the Earth. And they time it perfectly so that you slow down just enough so that when you come back around, you end up landing in Houston, Texas. Or, or sorry, California. either California or Florida. Yeah, Houston's where they run it from. But, yeah. No, they tried to, they always, the space show, they always tried to land it in Florida, but sometimes the weather didn't cooperate and they had to land in California. It just kind of stinks if you land in California and you need to get it all the way back. It's really expensive yeah, yeah. to put on that plane and, yeah. So, they anyway. The, uh, they oh. probably do. <laughs> probably do. Okay. So, here's why you have to do that 8,000 kilometers per or 8,000, 8 kilometers per second, 8,000 meters per second. Because if you go 8,000 meters away, you're 5 meters above the Earth. And remember how we said in one second, you fall, things fall 5 meters. So if you, in one second, if you get 5 meters to fall down, well, really, you haven't gotten any closer to the Earth. You've fallen 5 meters, but the Earth has curved away by 5 meters. 
That's why you're able to stay in orbit. Okay? And again, we didn't really, didn't really talk about the forces here, but, well, let's, yeah, here we go. Oh, this is a check question. As the ball leaves the girl's hand, one second later it will have fallen. Well, let's see, there's two five meters. It's either none of the above, or it's not none of the above, or ten. Five meters below the dashed line, or less than five meters below the, the point. Five meters, yeah. So let's look and see. Oh, I didn't put it in there. Yeah, it's exactly five meters below the dashed line. This is if there was no gravity. And remember, with gravity, it'll fall five meters, one second. OK? All right. Um, this is another one here. OK. The, our book author does this thing. I'm going to show you the little video. So I've got to get the speakers out, too. On the, he, he sets up this bowling alley, if you will. And he, and he sets it up and he says, oh, look, if there was a giant bowling alley and we were able to roll a bowling ball across this bowling alley all the way around the Earth with no friction, what would happen? And he, st- and he talks about how we get to this point. Eventually, he says, what if it's, we do it, what if, how fast do we have to make it go so that it can jump across this gap? Okay? All right, so let's see if I can find that one. Hewitt, 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 videos. Let's see, here we go. Video. I think this is the one, let's see. Here's the world. Let's suppose we put a bowling alley up in the sky. You guys hear that? We'll put it up in the sky mm-hmm. to get away from the air drag. Oh, about 50 miles up, yeah? And we'll kind of get a support there if it doesn't fall down. Oh, this Big is, hang on. This is first class bowling, man. Okay, now you take that bowling There we ball, go. Sorry, let, let me just start over. When it's here, look. Here's okay. the world. And let's suppose we put a bowling alley up in the sky. We'll put it up in the sky to get away from the air drag. Oh, about 50 miles up, yeah? You know, we kind of get it supported there so it doesn't fall down. Big structure. This is first class bowling, man. Okay? Now you take that bowling ball and you roll it. When it's here, the force of gravity acting like that. When it gets over here, force of gravity acting like that. Is that down? No. You're under that. Aren't? Some people like that. It's always this way. Come on, put yourself in a frame of reference to the world. Get a cosmic view, yeah? Okay. How about here? Which way is down, gang? Australians now. Yeah? Like that, okay? And everywhere here, note how the force is pulling. Always perpendicular. And if it's pulling perpendicular, then there's no component along the alley. So once you've got it rolling, how's it gonna roll? Steady, steady, steady. Unless you mess with it. Okay? So let's suppose I get it rolling at a certain speed. I wanna I wanna stop on that one for one sec. So I didn't really talk about this too much. When when it's rolling on this, on this bowling alley here, the only force on it, forget about friction, the only force on it is this inner force. right? It's the one that he drew going in here. There's no side to side force. If it's going from side to side at a constant speed, Newton's first law says that it'll what? Stay at that constant speed. So if this was all frictionless and he got the bowling ball going, it would just keep going all the way around. No reason not to. It's being pulled in at each instant, right? So no reason not to. Okay. Da, 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 da. And let's suppose I cut part of the alley away here. Great trick on. Here it comes. I'm rolling at maybe like uh, four kilometers per second. It's pretty fast. Here we go. Later on, come to the edge and we'll hit. <laughs> Crash into the ground. Roll it faster. <laughs> Crash into the ground over there. Roll it faster. <laughs> boom, boom. Still crash into the ground. I wonder there'd be a speed you could move it such that it would clear the gap. How many say, oh no, there's no way to clear that gap. <laughs> Stand up. Go on. Is there a sp- See if you're sitting next to someone can calculate in their mind, the reason in their mind, or come up with the answer. How fast it got to go to clear the gap? What'd be the answer, gang? 
Past tense of eat? Eight. Eight kilometers per second. You're going to clear the gap. How about if you make the gap this big? Woo, going to clear that gap? How about you make the alley this big? Here's the alley. Now here's your gap. Get it going eight kilometers per second. What are you going to do? You're going to clear the gap. You come right back again. Take it away and send it off. Hey, huh? So it keeps moving at steady speed because it's always being pulled sideways to the way it's moving, yeah? Okay. So, so there's our nerdy instructor's book author's uh, description of how, it's, uh, how it works. So the height at which it attains 11 kilometers per second is the height that it's going to overlap to the rest of it. Uh, actually, as it turns out, as it turns out, it's the same speed no matter if you're closer or farther away. Yeah, I think. Right. I think I'm getting so, that right. Yeah. So if I had a ball this high off the ground. Eight kilometers per second, yep. Yep. Cool. So that would apply to this. That would apply to this, yep. Eight now, okay. yes, this that would apply to this. Right. The gap, yeah. right. Yep. Yep. So on a um, on a planet like Jupiter, it would have to go much faster. Yes. Well, it would have to go faster for a, a number of reasons, but it's also it's bigger and it's more massive. So there's two reasons in there that, that kind of combine to each other. Okay. So it's got to go it's got to go faster because there's more gravity really, and it's also a bigger amount of it, it takes longer to fall the same distance because there's a curvature's less. Yeah. The, the only inner force. The only force. Yeah. The only force is the gravity inwards there and inwards there and inwards there and inwards there. Is there any force he pushing? Perpendicular to what? Sorry? He mentioned perpendicular to the center of the Earth, the tangent line. So if it's going this way, or rather to the direction it's traveling, it's whatever perpendicular to the direction it's traveling. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we already did the interactive orbital tra trajectory of cannonballs. Okay. All right. Now we show that there's a place, and actually I think Brank mentioned earlier, that 11.2 kilometers per second, you actually, what we call, escape from the Earth. Okay. You reach your escape speed or your escaped velocity. Okay. Turns out, remember that you never officially get as you never get outside the Earth's gravitational field. But you can be going fast enough so the Earth can never pull you back in. And that's the speed you have to obtain if you want to go out, if you want to actually escape from the Earth's, uh, in, from either orbit or from being pulled back in. Okay? Keep in mind, if I, were to take a, if I were to take a satellite and like somehow just put it right there, would it be in orbit? No, what would it have to do? Well, yeah, you'd have to start it moving somehow. If you did just leave it, put it right there, what would it do? It wouldn't stay there because there's plenty of gravity. It would not drift off. There's plenty of gravity. It would. It would go. It would go. Foop straight to up. Go foop and crash into the earth. Why not? It's just like it's just if I have a pen. What's the difference between me holding a pen here or holding a pen 200 miles up? It's the same, right? If I was able to hold the pen 2,000 miles up, it would go <laughs> boom and hit the ground, right? Yeah. But once it falls into orbit, wouldn't it catch it? And then ah, how is it going to fall into orbit? It's going to fall. So it's going to ah. hit the orbit. It's hit the Not really. It's got to be going sideways before it can be changed. Like it's got to be have that velocity somewhere in there. By the way, when they when they launch rockets up, they if you've ever seen them launch the space shuttle, right? They they start it going straight up, right? Yeah, and then when it gets to a certain point, they actually fire some rockets that turns it into the orbit. So it starts going this way, and then they turn it sideways, and it goes in there. Yeah, and then and then they get it going eight kilometers per second and being around. Okay, so yeah, and by the way, there's also these kind of satellites called geosynchronous satellites, right? If this is the Earth, I'm going to draw it really small for a reason. And I have a satellite way up here that as it's going around, okay, it's going around the Earth, 
as it's going around, the Earth turns a little bit and happens to turn the same amount that the satellite has gone this way. And then it goes a little farther, and the Earth turns a little bit more because it's, you know, rota it's, it's rotating just you know, because that's what the Earth does on its axis. And it does that, and then 24 hours later, it's back up to where it was, and the Earth has gone around once 24 hours because the Earth does that. That satellite, if you look up at it, seems to be hovering right up there. It's not hovering at all. It's kind of going, it's just going around the same rate as the Earth. These kind of satellites are good for things like television. Not GPS, as it turns out. Uh, well, we don't use them, don't, those are GPS, but television, uh, satellite phones, communication satellites. It's great because you can always point your dish right at it. Okay? Um, for those of you on ships, you ever use the sailor phone? Yeah, there's a sailor phone, which you can call home with, right? And you have to actually, the sailor phone actually is, is on a little, um, what do they call it, a gimbal, where it follows a satellite. And it has to move to ch follow a satellite because the ship's moving through the water. But the satellite dish on the side of your house, if you've got one of those little, what is it, dish network or whatever the other one is, do you ever have to change that? No, you just point it right at the one place because that's where the satellite is more or less, seems like it's hovering up there. And that distance, by the way, I don't even know how long, so, so I'll give you a hint. This isn't even a very good hint. Here's where the space shuttle is, 200 miles. Wow. This, any ideas how many miles? A million miles. It's not a million, it's not 800. Six. It's actually, let me think. I got to get that, I, I think it's about 22,000 miles away, okay? And what that also means, if you've ever used sailor phone, by the way, you're talking to your like girlfriend or whatever, and there's a big delay. And the delay is not because the technology's bad, it's because the light has to go all the way up here and then all the way back. And it takes 0.25 seconds to get up there, or sorry, 0.1, let's see, what is it? Point one, yeah, 0.125 seconds to get up there, and another 0.125 seconds to get back which is about 0.25 seconds, so it takes a quarter of a second, no matter what, and there's no way to speed that up. And, and Impossible. You have, to, you have to talk fast as soon as uh, <laughs> they pick up or the hello. Oh yeah, the and delay, yeah. yeah. We're lucky yeah. here, the, the, everything here is based on like ground lines that actually go, most of everything, ground connections that are actually cables that go on the Earth. So they, instead of going 22,000 miles up and 22,000 miles back, it might go 5,000 miles around the side of the Earth, or 10,000 miles, or something like that, so not as much delay. With, with the uh, sailor phone on the ships, yeah. the prepaid phone cards don't count the minutes down, so you can use it free. Really? Yep. It used to, be the, you, used to be that you'd have to double up, you had to get a special card, yeah. and now you can get other ones. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. So for the 1.2 kilometers per second to get away from their surface, yes. is that is it parallel to the ground that you'd have to do that, or is that straight up? Uh, it's, it's, well, it's really just your speed. Because whatever you, all you need to do is be traveling that fast in a direction away from the Earth, whether it's sideways or otherwise. And that's, yeah, that's all, all you need to be doing. Yeah, I think. So, it depends. Really, at that point, the Earth doesn't, it doesn't really matter that the Earth is round and so forth, because you're still going away from it once you get a bit of distance away. Why not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had to calculate how much it would take to get out of their orbit. Absolutely. Yeah, Mars is an interesting one. When, when they were looking at going from Earth to Mars, way over here, and the sun is like, well, sun is down here somewhere, right? They had to figure out exactly which direction to shoot the satellite, or to shoot the, uh, the uh, well, the rocket or whatever, so that it would hit that where it ended up at. Yeah, it's kind of like... Um, if you ever shoot uh, birds or something, right, you got to lead them a little bit. But you can't shoot right at them. You got to lead a little bit in front of them. It's the same sort of thing with this. They had to figure out where it was going to be and then shoot it so that it ended up going right for it in the end. And kind of cool. It was on Mars, they had to calculate how, how, how to leave the orbit. Yeah. Once it was on Mars, they had to calculate how to leave orbit, yeah. The, 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 I don't know if you saw the most recent ones that are on there when they, that, that are on Mars. The way they got them down there, it's amazing. They, they shot the, they, they had them in the little satellite that was orbiting around Mars. 
they blasted off the little robot in the like in this other ball. spacecraft thing. It wasn't the ball one? That was the previous one. This one, they actually had a rock a, a thing go down. It had a parachute first to slow down a little bit. Then it had rockets come out and go, <laughs> and then it dropped the robot on a little string down to the ground. And then the string broke and it went <laughs> and left the robot there. It's amazing. You got to look it up on YouTube. The Mars lander, whatever. Yeah, that was the latest one. The, the latest one. The other one they actually did it with. They put it in a that giant ball, and yeah, it was a big like big uh, plastic rubber, rubber ball, ball, and it was in the middle. And they launched this thing, and it landed and bounced a whole bunch of times, and then stopped, and then opened up, and the robot drove out. Yeah, the first two were really small. Though. The first, first two were like this big versus yeah truck size. Like an SUV size. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Anyway, okay, so that's. I think at this point that's enough about satellites and gravity and so forth. Okay, any questions about that? I'm sure there'll be plenty later. There'll probably be plenty later. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll get some check questions tonight on this stuff, and we can talk about the kinds of questions we'll uh, we'll do. Maybe we should do. Should we spend five minutes doing the check questions on this stuff now? Yeah, let's do that right now. And then we'll go and, oops, then we'll go into fluid mechanics. Okay, uh, let's see. For clicker questions, they call them. Okay. All right. Okay. Oops. There we go. Okay. All right. Who discovered gravity? Well, I think that's a little. It's a little bit odd, right? It was. You kind of knew. Early humans knew gravity existed, right? So yeah, early humans were the ones. That's kind of a trick question. Early humans were the ones who discovered it. Newton discovered that gravity is universal. Everything has gravity. Before, the early humans just thought the planets were in their own, their own thing, right? OK. Concept of free falling objects. Yep. The concept, does it apply to falling apples? Does it apply to the moon, or both, or n neither? OK. The moon is in free fall. Oh, one thing we didn't really talk about was why astronauts feel weightless. If you are, if you, here's the Earth, and let's say, here's the space shuttle. I'm going to draw a terrible space shuttle. Oops. Let's see. Let's say it has wings, and it comes around like that, and then, you know, whatever. <laughs> the terrible space shuttle. Let's say we had a space shuttle look like that, right? The wings maybe go like, you know, whatever. Whatever, whatever. OK, well, anyway, you're on here, and you are in there. And you're, you're standing in there with no legs, it looks like. You're standing in there, OK? And the space shuttle is falling to the Earth, right? It's going this way, but it's being pulled this way. Are you, what are you doing? You're falling. You're also falling. So isn't it just the same as being in an elevator with all the other people in there, and you're all falling at the same time? And the elevator's also falling. The space shuttle is falling. You're falling. Your M&Ms are falling, or whatever you're eating up there, right? The, the wrench that you're using to try to fix the computer before you, you know, it blows up or whatever, that's falling. Everything's falling. And so there's no reason for you not to float around in there, because everything with you is falling. So that's why it feels weightless. Everybody's falling. Yeah, Louie. And unlike the, the elevator, you actually still feel your, your... Oh, no, you do. In fact, in fact, you feel that the whole time up there, which is why some of the astronauts get really sick the first couple days they're up there. Some of them get uh, just... It's basically space sickness because they feel like they're falling the whole time. Yeah. It's, 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 supposedly, it's a very odd, odd feeling. Um, <laughs> like to see you try it. All right, I'm going to have to beep that, too. Okay. So yes, and indeed, it is both, both the above are free falling. OK, now let's see. If the distance between two planets doubles, the force of gravity does what? Think about this before you answer. Don't just answer. Don't answer. Just think which one it is. Okay. If the distance gets twice as big, what happens to the force of gravity? Okay. Let's, try, let's, try, let's try it this way. Raise your hand if you think it's doubles. Good, zero. Raise your hand if you think it's quadruples. One, two, three, four. 
Raise your hand if you think it decreases to half. One, two, three. Raise your hand if it decreases to a quarter. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two, four, six, eight, ten. That is everybody. Okay. Well, should I make I won't even make you guys explain why. But da da. Okay. Force equals G M1 M2 divided by distance squared. If the distance is twice as much, if D goes from 3 to 6, right, that means it's the square of that change, but less because this distance is on the bottom here. So you guys who said quadruples was close, were close. The ones who said half, you were right because it was, you were close. You guys were also close. I'm glad nobody said doubles. You were, would have been all wrong. The guys who said quadruples, you were right about that because of the squared part. But you forgot the d squared is on the bottom of the fraction. So the farther apart, less gravity. You guys who said decreases to half, okay, you were right that it was on the bottom, so it gets smaller, but you forgot about the squared part. Okay, and you guys decreases to a quarter were just brilliant. OK, good job. All right. All right. Next, if the distance, ah, now you all get this one right. If the distance between the two planets decreases to half, the force of gravity between them does what? I'll give you a second to answer this one, or think about this one. So it's going from here, and then they're getting closer. The distance is smaller, yep. OK, how many people think doubles? One. How many people think quadruples? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many people think decreases to half? Zero. How many people think decreases to a quarter? Some people didn't answer. One. Seven on quadruples. Seven on quadruples. All right. So we had it this way. OK, let's, let's cancel some of these out, first of all. If you get closer, are you going to have more gravity or less? More. You're going to be closer, so you're going to have more. So that can't be decreases ones, right? Hmm, OK. Is it a distance squared rule or a distance rule? Distance squared. Distance squared. So if you're decreasing by half, 1 half squared is what? 1 fourth. But remember, you're, gonna, you're, on, you're actually getting closer, so you increase by four times. I'll show you the, the formula here. So, so, you guys, so you guys said decrease? No, because we're getting closer. You said increase. It's not doubles because it's a square law. Okay? But otherwise, it's good. So here, remember the formula. Force equals g m1 m2 divided by distance squared. If that number gets smaller, this is going to get bigger by the square of the amount. Okay, good. What's the m1, m2? I know I missed oh, that. Oh, that's right. You missed that. I'm sorry. This is the two masses that we're talking about. So in this case, it would be the two planets' masses. Yeah. So as one, if, you, if, you, and if you're talking about on Earth, one of these is the Earth. And then if you want your weight, this the other one is you. So your mass is the other one. So if you get twice as big, you have twice as much force of gravity on you. If you get less, by, if you get half as big somehow, somebody chops you in half, a magic experiment, then you uh, end up uh, half the amount of gravity. Good. All right. Ah, last one of these. I'm not going to make you guys try to answer these ones. When the distance decreases by 1 tenth, distance gets smaller by one tenth, the force is 100 times bigger, because 10 squared is 100. OK, good. All right, 100 times bigger. OK, you're not going to worry about that question, because I didn't talk about that. Uh, space probe, not going to worry about that. Shrunk, sun were twice as massive. Uh, weight, these are all about the weight one. Hang on. I'm going to try to get to some. According to the equation for gravity, if you travel far enough from Earth, the gravitational influence of the Earth, does it ever reach zero? Never, Never right? 
Will this always still be there? Yes. Is it going to get bigger? No. no, that's weird. So yeah, it's still going to be there. Good. Okay, still be there. OK. Uh, you are weightless when you are in free fall? Yep. Without a support force? Yes. Sure you are. Without a support force, that's where you feel like you're falling, so there's nothing pushing you back. Infinitely away from all mass? Yeah. If you somehow could be, you would be. All the above. Good. All right. Uh, here we go. When an astronaut is in orbit around Earth is weightless. When an astronaut in orbit around Earth is weightless, he or she is beyond the pull of gravity? No. Careful on that one. It's no, because you're not. You're still within the Earth's gravity. It's actually about the same. So you're still in the grip of Earth's gravity. And let's see. Are you in the grip of interstellar gravity? No, that doesn't mean anything. When an astronaut is weightless, he or she is still in the grip of Earth's gravity. There's no system. Yeah. Good. <laughs> there you go. Let's see. Uh, oh, here we go. Inhabitants, last one. Inhabitants in the International Space Station orbiting Earth, are they weightless? Yes. Are they in the grip of Earth's gravity? Yes. Are they without a support force? Yes. That's all of the above. Okay. Good. Oh, you know what? We do have uh, a couple more. I forgot about the projectile one. A ball rolls off the edge of the table and hits the floor. If the ball's speed were somewhat greater, the time to hit the floor would be what? Same. Same, Same right? That was the whole point of that last one. Same. OK. All right. Uh, let's see that. I don't know about that one. No, let's see. What's this one? Aha. Mm. Positions of the cannonball are shown at various times when air resistance isn't a factor. If the speed were significantly greater, how high above the ground level would the cannonball be at four seconds? Eight. At four seconds. Yeah, it's 80 because distance is 1 half AT squared, right? So that's just the same, same sort of thing, or GT squared. OK, that's enough of those questions, I think. I mean, I can see if there's any other good ones in here. Uh, projectile follows a curved path, all the above. OK, I think that's good enough for now. OK. All right, let's start out this next one, and then we'll take another, our second break. So that was gravity. The next topic, which is actually just a huge, huge, huge field in itself, is fluid mechanics. There are scientists and engineers whose entire careers are based on fluid mechanics. OK, so we're going to talk one chapter for the next hour, and then you know we're not going to quite even scratch the surface on it. But we're going to talk about some big ideas related to fluid mechanics. But my first question here is, what is a fluid? Well, give me an example of a fluid. Water. Water's a good example. Somebody else? Oxygen. Is oxygen a fluid? It's a gas. It's a gas. Is a gas a fluid? Yes. What word could I have used that wouldn't include oxygen? A liquid, right? So liquids are different than fluids. So two different ideas here. A fluid, OK, includes liquids and gases. OK? That's what a fluid is. So you got to know the difference between liquids and gases. We are not specifically going to talk about liquids and gases. We're going to talk about fluids, which includes both. Why do we say that? Liquid's fluid. Well, when you slosh things back and forth, when it can slosh back and forth, it's fluid motion. It's flowing, right? Gases are really the same thing, even though you generally don't see them. If you could see the air in here, like when there's smoke and stuff, you can see that the smoke is you know, moving around and so forth, right? That's because it's also a fluid. Okay, So liquids and gases are certainly not the same thing. But in terms of what we're talking about, you can consider them both fluids. Fair enough? OK. All right. So we've mentioned this before, I think. I think we mentioned density before. Density is very important when we, when we talk about fluids and solids and liquids and gases and all that. What it is is it's a measure of the compactness of how much mass something occupies, an object occupies. Okay. Air pressure in a tire. Like air pressure in a tire, that well, 
it's more like the actual tire itself being kind of the whole tire filled with air. It's like, does it have lots of mass in a certain amount of space? Here, I have a question. Let's say you have a tire filled with air, right? It's got some density based on how much volume there is and how much mass there is. What if I were to deflate the tire and squish all that rubber together into a tiny little ball? Is it going to be more or less dense than before? I heard half. <laughs> have it half. It's actually going to be more dense because there's more mass in a smaller amount, or well, the same amount of mass in a smaller amount of space. That's what the density is all about. Okay? Things that are very dense. Lead is very dense. Why? Because in a tiny little lead box, it's really heavy. There's lots of mass there. So all the atoms are really close together and there's, there's lots of mass in that tiny little space. So it's mercury. What's that? So it's mercury. So is mercury. Mercury is also, in fact, got some mercury, the mercury thing to talk about in a little bit. Um, and it is extremely dense. Exactly. Okay? Water is fairly dense. Ever tried like you know those giant water bottle things, or the, the keg, you know, the ones you flip over for the water, uh, drinking machine things? They're, carried, they're heavy. These things weigh like, you know, 30, 40, or 50 pounds, right? I mean, they're not, they're not light. It's because water is very dense and has a lot of mass for the amount of space. Okay? All right. So that's basically, it's the lightness or heaviness of materials of the same size. So it's like when you have a gallon of water, a gallon of milk. Uh, mm, yeah. Size, but it's, it's, one weighs more, than it's more like I, I think what that that's true. Milk's similar. How about a gallon of uh, a gallon of water or a gallon of um, oil? Yeah, oil is a good oil is lighter, right? And so it's yeah. not quite. It's still pretty pretty dense, but not not nearly as dense. Yeah, yeah. So density we define it this way: mass divided by volume. Okay, and. The mass is going to be either grams or kilograms, as we've been doing. Volume is in centimeters cubed or meters cubed. Why is something, why is volume in a cubed unit? It's the first time we've had a cubed unit before. Because it's got depth, like you said, maybe width, we'll call it. Maybe, it doesn't really matter. Same depth with height, length and height. And when you multiply those together, there's three things you're multiplying together, so that's why it ends up cubed. So volume is always in a cubed unit. We're not going to worry about much of that. Okay? And here's part of your mercury thing. Density of mercury, 13.6 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay? Water is actually defined. They actually define, well, they used to. I'm not sure they do anymore. Water is one gram per centimeter cubed. Yeah, mercury is 13.6 times as much as dense. Okay, which is pretty cool. Okay. And mercury, by the way, is the, it's a metal that's liquid at room temperature. Why, why is it dangerous for uh, Well, good question. The question is, why is mercury dangerous? Uh, a couple different reasons. Mainly because when it gets into your body, it actually stays in your body. And your body doesn't, it's in certain forms. You can actually, don't do this at home, you could drink mercury and you'd be fine. Because it would probably, elemental mercury, well, Supposedly it goes right through you, and I mean like right through you, if you know what I mean. Um, that they supposedly people used to do that as a joke. They'd be like, give somebody some mercury, and whoop, oh, I gotta go, you know, right through you. Probably not a good idea. Not a good idea. When mercury actually evaporates, then it gets. It's easy to yeah, inhale, and it's easy to get into your. Um, it can get into your uh, bloodstream, and then it lodges in your, um, I guess, in your body, and then it causes bad things to your brain and. All that. Supposedly, Isaac Newton actually did a lot of things with mercury and then went crazy. So, supposedly. Anyway, that's, that's density. And we'll talk about density a little bit later when we get into what happens when you actually submerge something in water. Okay? All right. Um, there's also this thing called weight density. Regular density itself is just mass divided by volume. Weight density is when you do the weight divided by volume. It really just adds a, another little term to it, um, pounds per cubic foot, or um, sometimes it's easier to, it's easier to think about uh, weight density. We will not really worry about the difference there. Uh, salt water, 64 pounds per foot cubed, a little more dense than fresh water, 62.4. Anybody been out to Lake Asal? Did you go swimming? Did you float like way up on there? That's because salt water and Lake Asal salt water is really salty and actually is much more, is 
not much, but more dense even than regular salt water. So you float much higher, and we'll talk about why that's the case. It has to do with the density of the fluid itself. Okay. So the dead sea. Sorry. So the dead sea. The dead sea, same way. Yeah, I think supposedly Lake Assal is actually is a little more salty. Yeah. Salty. Saltiest place on earth. Yeah. Tell you what, let's take our next break right now, and then we'll do pressure when we get back. Great. All right. Going? Good. Okay. So we talked about density, which is just the weight or the mass divided by the amount of space or the volume. Now we're going to talk about pressure, which is a little bit different here. Pressure, and my question is, why can a dull knife still cut through a piece of clay? You, you, are, you are applying a force on there. That tiny little edge is able to put a lot of pressure, force divided by area. How much area is there on the tiny little itty bitty part of an edge of a knife? Not much at all, right? This is actually why knives cut anything. Because you can put a lot of force on a tiny amount of area and you get a lot of pressure. And that's really what's going on when you're cutting something with a knife. You're actually putting a lot of pressure onto those little pieces of whatever you're cutting into. Hopefully not skin. Right? The sharper the knife, the smaller amount of area, and the easier it is to cut through something because of the amount of pressure there. Yeah. What's that? You don't, you don't need as much force. Yeah. You can only push so much force on something, right? Like you can only put so much force into it. But the amount of area depend, gives you the amount of pressure. So small, notice another one where it's on the bottom. As the area goes up, the pressure goes down. But if the area gets smaller, 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 the amount of pressure goes up, up, up. And that's how you can end up getting, cutting through something. Okay? So the pressure depends on the area over which the force is distributed. We'll get to that a little later when we talk about buoyancy as well. This one's another interesting unit, one pounds per foot squared, or newtons per meter squared, or this thing called pascals. You might have heard of pascal in a different one. There's a math, term, a math thing called a pascals triangle where it goes, one and then one three one and then one four four one. Have you ever seen that math class? Well, anyway, Pascal was a he was a mathematician. He was a scientist. He was a theologian. Uh, might have been a chemist. I'm not sure, but he definitely did a lot of this stuff. We have a unit. He was pretty good, you know, with pressure and all this. So that's why we have a unit called a Pascal and kilopascals. Yes. Okay. All right. A liquid or even a, fl a fluid, but in this case a liquid, the pressure in a liquid is, wh is when something is in that liquid, it's the force per area that the liquid actually pushes onto something. Okay? So you ever gone and ever uh, gone swimming or something, you pick up a rock on the, on the bottom of the wherever you're swimming and you bring it up to the surface and then the instant you get it out of the surface it goes, oh, it's really heavy. And you notice that it's a lot heavier when it's out of the water than when it's in the water? It's because the water is putting pressure on it to hold it up a little bit. Okay? It's called a buoyant force. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay? But also, when you, when you go swimming, the deeper you go, the more pressure there is because there's more water above you. And that water is compressing down and causing the amount of pressure. So if you go, if you dig, if you start diving underwater, you'll notice your ears start getting more and more and more compressed. And if you're actually diving, anybody go diving in here, scuba diving, a few people? Yeah, you'll know, you know how you have to blow your, no, blow the, uh, your nose to, pre to depressurize or to uh, equalize, I guess it is? It's because there's lots more pressure on there and your ears can't handle until you blow out to, to keep the pressure on both sides of your eardrums the same. Okay? So the amount of pressure is, uh, due to how high, how deep you are in the water, how much water is above you. And it's also due to how much air is above you. Because air also has weight and also provides a pressure. Hmm. We don't really think about that too much, but we'll get on, get to that in a second. Okay, let me show you the, our little, our fun professors. 
the videos I'm going to show you. So you notice the other videos he's doing during a class. He does a couple of these during a class too. But most of these are actually like, it looks like he went back to the class and did separate demonstrations. He gets a little goofy. Like, I mean, it gets a little weird. Like, Sorry. you'll see. Uh, okay, videos. Now, when somebody yawns and it pops their ears, I've, I've heard that the reason why other people have to yawn is because it changes the pressure slightly in the direct vicinity. I think you're crazy. I thought it was crazy. <laughs> but I'm not sure. I have not heard that one before. Uh, let's see. We wanted pressure. So this is about how air actually has pressure. Let's see what we can do here. Hi, gang. Atmospheric pressure time. Oops. Colored water, card, turn it upside down, and it stays. Now, wouldn't you think the water pressure would push the card away? But there's another pressure around stronger than that water pressure, and that's the air pressure, the pressure due to the atmosphere. The atmosphere at 20 miles high is squashing in this glass a lot more than the water is pushing down. Have you tried this before? You can actually, you can take a cup of water, and it's good, if, it's good to have a cup that has like a nice rim on it that, that's not squishy or too squishy. But if you do that, you fill it about a quarter of the way with water, or halfway with water, put a card on top of it, and the card should be something, you know, pretty, uh, yeah, smooth, uh, like a folder works, but cardboard works pretty well. And if you flip it over, you can actually take your hand out, and you can hold the, the if you can take your hand off it like he's doing, and, you can, and it'll hold right there. Right. I thought the and, air in the cup sucks the water up, so it won't drop. Ah, well, this is he's he actually That's just it. talked about what it is. So there's no so when when you okay think about this, when you turn the card upside down, the water what's 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 in there right now, right is, uh, well let's see let's think about this. Yeah, when it when when you flip the the card up or the the thing upside down, right, the water squashes to the bottom, and actually pushes out some of the air, right? And there's actually a, well, it's not even that really. I guess there's air on top of the water. But the, the water is pushing down on, the, on that piece of paper. But it's not enough pressure to push to, there's so much pressure from the air around that it pushes up more than the water pushes down. And it pushes in as well. But, um, but that's the, the big thing. So watch what else he does here. What he's got here is a hot plate. And he's got some soda cans. And you tell it's kind of old because that's the old Pepsi logo. Right? And I hope he got paid for that, for putting Pepsi on here. Probably did. Um, anyway, and he's got a tiny little bit of water in there. Just a little bit of water. And what it is, is it's actually steam right now because it's boiling. What he's going to do is he's going to take that, he's going to flip it over into this cool bit of water. And he's going to make the pressure inside the can go down because the, the water is going to cool very quickly. And all those molecules which have pushed out the air are going to cool down, and there's going to be much less air inside the can. So watch what happens. Pushes the card up a lot harder than it's being pushed down. And I can show you atmospheric pressure in action with these cans. I have some heated water, and the water molecule is going very fast inside there. What would happen if I slow those water molecules down? What would happen to the pressure inside the can? Let's try it and see. I'll dip it in this cold water. Ah. Did you and see that? What happened here? I know. Reduce pressure inside, but the pressure outside, just the same. And Karancharuni, pressure yep. difference, can be very, very dramatic. Physics is fun. <laughs> he loves that, yeah. Um, so, so anyway, so his point was that there is actually pressure, air pressure, which you guys all know about. There's air pressure, but it's actually a lot. It's actually enough to crush a can if there's not much pressure inside the can. Okay. I know there's some more here that were... Good here. Let's see. We're going to get to buoyancy in a minute. Flotation. No. His name is Paul Hewitt. He's the guy. Who wrote, one of the guys who wrote your book. I noticed the book said physics. Fun physics. Yeah, fun physics. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Archimedes. Air is matter. I know there was one more here. Air has weight. Let's just try this one and see what he says here. Let's see. Okay. Air has any weight? It turns out air has weight, a lot of weight, if you talk about a lot of air. Okay? What's it go here? One cubic meter of air. Like this, huh? Like about like this. Bam. How much weight do you think one cubic meter of air has? Not a whole lot. Unless it's one thousand kilograms of air? Of air? Uh, of air. 
It's one meter. Like he's got a meter stick in his hand. This much by this much by this much. How much does the air weigh? Not much. What do you think? 100 pounds? 10 pounds? 1 pound? 0 0.2 pounds? Less than 1 pound? Let's see. Bam. One cubic meter of air, like a little small truckload, right, has one and a quarter kilograms. Okay, that's about two and three quarter pounds. Two and a half, so almost try this over two and a half pounds. Open up the fridge. Now your fridge is about three quarters of a cubic meter. Ask the people at the house. Hey, the air inside there have any weight? What are they going to say? No. Yeah, it's got some weight. See that big grapefruit sitting there on the shelf? Does that have any weight? Say so which weighs more, the grapefruit or the air? Take a guess. You get about two pounds of air in wild band. And if that grapefruit's less than a two pounder, then the weight of air in that refrigerator is greater than the weight of so greater than the weight of a dozen of eggs. A dozen of eggs weigh less than the air in an ordinary sized refrigerator. Hmm. Air actually does have weight. Right? We don't normally think about it having weight, but we do. So when you take a scuba bottle that's an 80 cubic foot cylinder and it's empty, why doesn't it weigh 160, 170 pounds when you fill it up to its max? When you have, when you fill up the, uh, when you fill it up with that 80 cubic feeder, 80, 80 cubic meters is actually not that much more. Yeah, we got feet and then we got meter. Well, he was doing meters. But 80 cubic meters is about eight times more, or so, well, it's, I guess it's 80 times more than one. So uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's a good question. I, think, I, I was thinking meters. Feet, it might be, yeah, it might be a little different. But yeah, it's, uh, it definitely weighs a little bit more. Not that you'd really notice, but it, should, it does weigh more when you compress the air and put it in there. OK, so let's see. Got pressure. Did he talk? Yeah, he talked about air pressure. I thought we had another one on there. Well, I didn't find one on there. OK. So the pressure in a liquid, okay, when you have something submerged in water, the pressure actually pushes on all the different sides, top, bottom, side, left, right, then of the object. Okay? It may not push quite the same on all sides, but it does push on all sides. And it's always perpendicular to whatever surface it is. If you were to take a glass and poke holes in it, the water always comes out perpendicular. Did you ever notice that? He actually does talk about this. I know there's a video on here where he talks about this. Um, in, let's see. I, no, I still don't see it. Air is matter. No, no, no. Buoyancy, Archimedes principle. Hmm. He may talk about it in one of them. I'm not sure which one. But the air actually, or the water coming in here always goes perpendicular. If you take a bucket and you poke holes in it and then submerge the bucket in the water, it's, the, the water always shoots out into the bucket perpendicular to the bucket. It doesn't shoot out at some weird like side angle because it's always perpendicular to the side of the bucket. Okay? All right. In a liquid, the pressure is actually completely independent of what the shape of whatever it's in is. It only has to do with how high that column of water is. And you can see this woman here has a bunch of different things. And notice all the level of all the different liquid is all the same. It's all connected by this bottom tube. Same depth. And what's that? It's the same depth. It's the same depth. It is the same depth. Think about it, what would happen if it was a little bit higher up here wouldn't that push make the pressure the same a little bit more down here? And so therefore, this one would want to go up a little higher, and this would go down. So it all le level, levels out. Did you ever hear that term, uh, water, likes to, water finds its own level? That's what that means. It means that whatever the level of the whole system is, that's what it's going to find. Okay? So it's all about how deep it is. All about how deep it is. The pressure only depends on how deep it is. And that's going to become more important. Anybody grow up in a town that has a water tower? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What's the reason for the water tower? So people can put their girlfriend's name on it. So <laughs> people can put their, exactly. People can put their girlfriend's name on it. So 
Nicholas is absolutely right. Nicholas said it's the pressure. A lot of people think that it has, the only reason it's there is so that it has, like it holds water, right? It's just to store water. Now, that is part of it. It definitely stores some water. But it's being continuously refreshed, hopefully, with, with new water when it, when it goes down. But Nicholas is absolutely correct. If you have this big column of water up here, there's a lot of pressure. And what you want to do is you want to be able to have pressure coming out of your spigot when you turn on your, or your faucet when you turn it on. And the only way that's going to happen is if there's a fair amount of pressure there. How do you get that pressure? You raise the water way up to the top, and then you have the pressure, or the enough pressure for that. Most of the time, the water towers are also built kind of on a high point in the town, too. So they're nice and high that way, too. Is that you, or is that a giant voice? It's probably going to be me soon now. Uh-oh. You guys hear about, like, big face exercises or anything? Do you guys get worried about holding? I don't. No. Okay. No. Is that what's happening? Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, there's some big exercise? Oh, great. Well, okay, so anyway, so, hang on. Okay, so no driving around. Because all you guys have cars, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Okay. You have a car? Yeah, well, there you go. Well, there you go. Okay. So anyway, so that's what the water does there. Now, buoyancy. Okay, you kind of all, maybe, have you heard, all heard the word buoyancy before? Something's buoyant, right? Buoyancy, okay, is how much this weight you actually lose when you go under a liquid when you're submerged into a liquid or floating, but you're submerged. You've got this other force that actually pushes up on you, okay, more than, uh, well, enough so that it changes your apparent weight, okay? And I know you had had some things on buoyancy, so I'm going to show you that. Let's see. Okay, buoyancy. Here we go. All right. Let's see if this is one of those ones where he's a little crazy. Nope. It's the right one. He's still crazy. But. There's the rock into the water. There's some pressure against the bottom. That pressure pushes against the bottom with a force. This pressure at the top, it pushes down with a force. Why am I making this arrow not so long as this arrow? This part's deeper. This part's deeper, that means there's more pressure. That means the water is forcing up against the bottom harder than at the top. <laughs> Why am I making these arrows between the light size of that and that? Why? In fact, I can ask you a question, you can answer it. Why is it when you submerge something in the water, it doesn't try to nudge sideways? You can see it. Check your neighbor. Okay, gang, let's look at it. We can see the rock is not void sideways. Why? Because these forces are the same. And the force underneath is always going to be greater than the force on the top because it's deeper. There you go. I'm sorry, in this case, how things think then? How come it sinks? Yeah. Ah, so what he didn't draw, that's a good question. What he didn't draw, let's see if we can go back to the rock there. OK, so well, he, let, here, I'll draw it like this. Here's the rock. And he said, there's a force here, and there's a force here that's the same, right? And then maybe there's a force up here, and a force up here that are the same, and a force down here, which is a little bigger, and a force down here, which is maybe a little bigger. And then there's a bigger force from this side than the little one up here. Okay, what didn't he draw onto this? He drew all the forces on the rock from the water. What didn't he draw? Yeah, he didn't draw the forces on the water, but we don't care about that. We only care about the rock because it's the rock we're trying to sink. What else is acting on the rock? I'll give you a hint. This is the earth underwater. There you go. Gravity, right? So the gravity is going to be there. now. This is going to be bigger than this, so therefore he's going to feel like it's going to feel like it's less weight, which is the whole point, right? So that buoyant force provides more than the one coming down, and therefore it feels like there's less weight. So that's good. Good question. Makes sense. All right. Yeah. Okay. Ah, here's the big one. The amount of weight. Now this is going. To, we're going to go back to this a couple times. The amount of weight that is different is the amount of weight of the water or liquid that's displaced. 
Okay, let's think about what that means. I take this rock, and it's got a certain volume, and I put it into the water. Well, doesn't the water that was where the rock is now get displaced, moved out of the way? When that gets moved out of the way, if you took all that water and captured it, the weight of that water is the amount of buoyant force up. Hmm. That's actually pretty cool. Okay, a guy named Archimedes figured that out. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, in fact, we'll get to it right now. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know why this is down too far. Um, let me see if I can let's see. No, oh, I can't. I can't quite get that one there. But let me. I do want to. I'll, I'll show you it from a different video or a different one. It is in the book, and it's also in the PowerPoint slide here, which. A lot of these are the same. There it is. OK, this one is what it should have been. Oops. Mm. Oh, there it is. OK, here we go. Archimedes principle. OK, this is what it should have been. So the apparent weight of a submerged object, this is the whole idea. What does an object weigh when it's underwater? The weight out of the water minus this buoyant force. Okay? Here's an example. Three kilogram block submerged in a water apparently weighs, now remember kilograms are not weight, but we're calling that for, for what we're worried about here, one kilogram. Okay? Well, if it was three and it became one, there's the extra two kilograms, which is the actual buoyant force. That's how much the water weighs. So that's what this little di diagram shows. It's the the uh, weight of the the weight of the mass is three kilograms. Well, we'll call it three kilograms. And there's nothing in the this little bucket. When you drop the weight into there and water spills out into this one, the weight of that one is now two, and this one is now one. So it's the weight of the liquid that's been displaced. Okay, and it's kind of cool that that's the case. Not necessarily intuitive that that's the case, but it's pretty cool that that's the case. And like I said, um, Archimedes, this guy Archimedes figured this out. Archimedes is he's also the guy that figured out that when you drop a, when you put an object into the water, the volume of that object is what spills out, right? And he supposedly he did this when he sat into his bathtub and water spilled out, and he realized that his volume was what's the amount of water that spilled out. And he said, Eureka. And that's where Eureka supposedly comes from. <laughs> right? Eureka? Yeah, he said, Eureka, I found it. Oh, like the and that city was it. California? Like the city in Northern California. Well, the reason, the, the story, as the story goes, the king, I forget which king, Archimedes, what is it, Greece or something? He the, was Greek. The, the king wanted to know if someone gave him a gold, I think it was a gold filling maybe? or a gold nugget of some sort, wanted to know if it was really gold. And Archimedes figured out that the only way he was going to be able to do that is if he knew what the, uh, if he knew the, the volume of it so he could figure, he could weigh it and figure out if it was dense enough to be gold or too dense or whatever. And he didn't know how to figure out the volume of this weird shaped nugget until he realized this principle that if you drop something into the water, if you capture the amount of water, you can measure the volume of the water. So, and then he saved the king's day and, I don't know, became all famous. That's the principle anyway. Okay? All right, so here's the displacement rule. A, and this is what he came up with. A completely submerged object always displaces a volume of liquid equal to its own volume. Okay? And that's the same. The amount of, the volume of this water here that spilled out is the exact same as the volume of that rock right there. So when we okay? say volume, Space. The space, yep, the space. That's different than Archimedes' principle, which says the buoyant force is the weight of that water. But, the, but it's a similar. It's related anyway. Related. Okay? All right. Okay, now we get into floating. Okay, I, I asked around my office today. I'm going to sneak, I'm going to sneak back one. I asked around my office today. I said, hey, why do Navy ships float? Okay, and, and of the people I asked, let's see, one got it absolutely right, maybe two did. 
One got it wrong, another guy got it wrong, another guy, so three got it wrong, two got it right. Was this so, all Navy? It was all Navy guys wow. who I asked. No, I did ask, no, I asked two Army guys. But the question was, one guy said, because it has wood in it. I'm like, no, no. Uh, no not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Well, let's figure out what's going on. Okay, and, and we do have another video here that I definitely, I'll show you in a sec. Okay, if I take a ball of steel, right, and I dump it into the water, Okay, it's going to sink right to the bottom, right? It sinks to the bottom because it only displaces a tiny amount of water, and steel is much more dense than water, right? So it displaces that amount of water, but not enough to keep to push up enough so that the weight of the the steel is pushed up by an equal amount of force, so it sinks. Okay, so the dense ball of steel gets pushed up but only by the amount of water, the, the weight of the water that it displaces, and it doesn't displace much water. What do they do to Navy ships to make them, s that are also made of steel, to actually float? The needs to more go ahead. No, go ahead. The weight of the ship needs to press down on the water and disperse more water weight than... You're right, you're right. The, the water needs to displace more, the, the ship needs to displace more water. What were you going to say, Tom? Equals to the weight. Equals to the weight. Well, it, the way they construct it, 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 that's exactly what it is. It's, uh, yeah. Go ahead. It's, it, I don't really know how to put it into words, but he, he had it right. Yeah, you, you both are on the, on the right, you actually both had it right. Okay, here's the steel block, right? The steel block displaces this much volume of water, right? Let's say, let's say this much, and it's going to be volume, right? So it's going to be a little box. It displaces that much, right? That much water. And if you look at that much water, that much water weighs less than the block. So the block sinks because it can't push up as much. Yeah, Tyler? No. Oh. Is that outside the bucket? This one. This one, look at how much water this one displaces. This one displaces, I'll draw it up here. Right? This one displaces this much, which is more than this amount. Okay? Maybe it's not quite as high because it still floats a little bit. But it displaces all of this. Whoops, actually, not, I drew it wrong. It displaces all of this water here, like that back as well. This amount of water is more than this amount of water, which this amount of water here in a square, right? And therefore, it can, it can do enough, it, the weight of that water is more, and therefore it can push up enough to keep it from floating. And in fact, I think it was um, Mike who said it, it's, if it's floating, the buoyant force is exactly the same as the weight. Is that what you said? The same amount? Exactly the same amount. Can't be more, because then it would go higher. It can be more if you push down farther. Right? If you kept pushing this ship down, or this little thing down until it was just above the water and then it popped back up, that's because you've actually pushed down with more and it's displaced more water than the weight of the object. So it pops up. Take a tennis ball that floats, right? And you stick it in, wa stick it in water and you push it down, well, you, it comes back up because now it's displaced more water. The weight of the water it's displaced is actually more weight than the ball, so it actually pushes back up. So a ship continues to do that if you add more weight. Like if you have a boat by itself, it already disperses it, but then you add people and machinery or whatever, it gets more and more, so yeah. it just continues to equal up that weight. Absolutely. Yeah, well, what it does, the only way it does that is it gets a little lower. So instead of the water being here, the water might be up here when you add more people. It'll actually go sink a little deeper. You see what I mean? So the more people, and then you, of course you can add too many, and then it actually sinks. Sink. Yeah, that's yeah. And every, every day they do what's called the draft report. There's numbers written along the water line, actually considerably above and below the water line. But they'll they'll take that reading every day. I didn't know that. That's yeah, cool. How, how would they adjust that if you have high, you know, tide and waves? And tide and waves doesn't matter. Because, Go ahead. Uh, well, it, no. The ship will rise at the same level as the tide. Yeah. Then the water level won't change at all. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, if you, so we talked about this earlier, you actually float a little higher in salt water 
because the salt water is more dense. And when you displace more salt water, if because it's more dense, it actually weighs more. So it pushes up harder. So you float a little higher. Some ships, you can take Navy ships. They don't do it that often. But through like uh, the riverway into the Great Lakes, which are freshwater, they actually sink down a little farther. So those lines would be a little bit lower on there. And another thing, when they go into fresh water like that, it also, uh, it, well, I mean, this is going over to this principle, but it, uh, the, the sea life, it'll die off and it'll clean everything out. Oh, that's true. It'll, it'll do that, but it sometimes it'll also transfer bad stuff into the lakes, yeah, too. Yeah. So that's yeah. not good. But yeah, let me. Let me see what Paul, good old Paul Hewitt, has to say about this. Let's see, videos, here we go. Buoyancy. We, we can get into water type integrity on a ship, too. If, <laughs> like, if we got hit by a mine. I want to get into water type integrity of a clue. There you go. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah. This is the rock into the water. There's some pressure against the bottom. That pressure pushes against the bottom of the force. This pressure at the top. It pushes down with a force. Why am I making this arrow not so Wait, did we, uh, did we see this one? Already? We already did see this one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. This keeper. He's angry. Oh. Yeah, I know. He's angry. Yeah. There, what's you the other one here? Ah, Archimedes Principle. I think he's that's the one. <laughs> yeah. You want me to be like that? Angry? Oh, this is... No, this is the different. This is Archimedes Principle. <laughs> Hang on. It was in a flotation, maybe? Yeah, that's it, flotation. Here we go. Here's a piece of wood. We know that floats in water. But when it floats, you notice the wood? It's still pushing some of the water out of the way. And that water is pushing out of the way, pulls it up. Turns out the weight of the water pushed out of the way equals the weight of the wood. How about a piece of clay? Ah, yeah, no, it sinks. But I tell you, when it does sink, it still pushes water out of the way. But not enough. Not enough. The weight of the water pushed out of the way is less than the weight of the clay. But you know what I can do? I can take this clay and squeeze it out. I'm not making it heavier. I'm making it bigger. And I can make it bigger so that when I put it in the water again, watch this. Ah, now it's pushing enough water out of the way to hold the boat up. I could make a boat like that out of lead, out of rock, out of steel, anything, so long as I make it wide enough. Physics. What? <laughs> a little crazy. Um, did you see him sneak the new other piece of clay in there? Yeah, like that wasn't here. I know. I saw the physics on the board. There you go. That was a little... Did you see the gorilla dancing in the background? Exactly, the gorilla yeah, in the yeah. background, yeah. Okay, so do we get buoyancy? This is, this is one of those things where um, I think it's not that hard to understand, but it's one key concept. The amount of liquid or fluid that you push out of the way, the weight of that is what pushes up. And if you push enough out because of your shape, you float. Okay? okay. By the way, that's exactly what happens with hot air balloons, helium balloons, hydrogen balloons, whatever else you've got that's floating because we're sitting in another fluid, in air. Okay, so it's actually, you know when you say, oh well, why does a helium balloon float? Well, it's because it's, helium's lighter? Yes, but it's in, it's actually buoyant in the air around you. It's actually being pushed up by the air. So it's, you know, it's kind of cool that way. That's why bigger people um, float better? Uh, good question, why bigger people float better. Generally, the reason bigger people float better is because there's, there's less dense material in them. Like the fat, I guess, is less dense in general than, say, muscle. But it's also, uh, uh, I guess you're pushing a lot more stuff out of the way, too. Yeah, That's a little odd. I hadn't thought about it quite like that. But yeah. I don't know. Do skinny people not float that well? I guess muscly people don't float so well. <laughs> I, I had a buddy that's 6'2". Uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen that before where, yeah, too much muscle, you don't float. The reason a person finds it easier to float in salt water, we kind of discussed this already, compared to fresh water, is that, is the buoyant force better or greater? <coughs> a person feel less heavy, is that why it's easier to float? Or is a smaller volume of water displaced? 
<coughs> yeah, it's the buoyant force. Oh, is it? Wait a minute. Did I get that right? I might have gotten that wrong. A smaller volume of water is displaced. That actually is true. Yeah. Is the buoyant force greater? Ah, good question. Is the buoyant force greater? What did we say the buoyant force was if you're floating? Equal to your weight. So the buoyant force isn't greater. Right? Right. L look, at the, look at the question again. I'm going to get rid of the thing. And a 62 pound force up, even if it's in, it's in solid. But forget about the feeling. A smaller volume of water is displaced because you don't need to displace much of the water. OK, now I think the next one here. So we talked about salt water. Can you, could you float on mercury? Mercury is heavier than water. So mercury is really, really dense. Yeah. Right? So you would float really high, right? Think anybody's ever done it? Uh, this guy has. Yeah. Look at how high he's floating. It's almost like he's just sitting on it. I mean, he pretty much is just sitting on it. But notice it's indented, right? That's actually mercury. That's a liquid that he's sitting on. Isn't that cool? He might not have been lived. Yeah, I don't know. He, I think, as I said before, elemental mercury, like the when it's in metal form, is not really that bad for you, despite what you'll hear on public service announcements. But um, they, uh, yeah, so you can do this. I heard one story about a guy who took a. Uh, th there was a contest at like a fair, at a bucket of mercury or a big uh, like an oil drum full of mercury, and you had to try to stick your fist down and see who could stick it down the farthest before they, you know, and they'd get a prize if you got up to your elbow or something like that. But I mean, notice, this guy's whole weight is there and he can't even, he's not even just sitting there. You probably couldn't stick your fist that far into the water. Would it push it back out? It would totally push it back out. Think about it. It's, <laughs> if you've ever taken like a, uh, I don't know, like a kickball or something that has a lot of air, a basketball, ever tried to push a basketball underwater? It's really hard. And it goes flying back up because it's really very, you know, not very dense. And so it doesn't need much force. But you push it, you know, you got to force it way down. It's yeah, the same sort of thing. I mean, and you have to write <laughs> before it hits your face. OK? Yeah. So don't try this at home. But, you know, if you happen to have a giant pool of mercury, you know, I'd do it. I'm sorry. I'd, say I'd do it. If I had a giant, like, pool of mercury, sure. I mean, what chance are you? When are you going to get a chance? Well, all right. Just saying, I don't think elemental, I don't think like liquid mercury is that bad for you, but yeah. OK. All right, on a boat ride, the skipper of the boat gives you a life preserver filled with lead pellets. When he sees the skeptical look on your face, he says that you'll experience a greater buoyant force if you fall overboard than your friends who wear styrofoam filled preservers. Number one, he apparently doesn't know his physics. Or number two, he's correct. You guys haven't noticed yet that I like trick questions in these things. These things. It's a it's a vest that has lots of lead in it, so it weighs a lot. It's like a weight vest. It's like a weight vest. Let's read what he says. He says. You will experience a greater buoyant force yeah. if you fall overboard. You will. He is correct. Right? So you actually, why, does it, why are you going to experience a greater buoyant force? Well, you're going to displace more water because you're going to sink to the bottom, <laughs> right? Hopefully, the styrofoam ones you'll float because there's you displace only a certain amount of water, right? So he is correct. He doesn't tell you you're going to drown, though, <laughs> right? Your your life preserver will submerge and therefore displace more water. Therefore, you're going to have a more buoyant force on you, but it's not going to be enough to keep you from sinking. So, don't wear life preservers filled with lead if there exists one. Okay, all right, good. OK. So I said earlier that gases are also fluids. Gas pressure is a measure of the amount of force per area that a gas actually exerts on whatever container it's in. OK? This is where you got to that. You were talking about the dive tanks, right? You put more pressure in there, the, there's actually or more gas in there, it, there's a higher pressure and more force against the tanks. <clears throat> if you've ever seen 
dive tanks, they're made of what? Like steel, right? I mean, they're, I guess they have aluminum ones maybe, but they've, they're, they're like really thick walls and whatever, because you're putting a lot of pressure in there and you don't want it to break. You don't want it to explode, especially. Okay? What's causing that pressure? Well, it's the molecules bouncing all around. They bounce off each other, right? And they bounce off the walls. And that's what's actually pushing against the walls, causing that pressure, the molecules are. Okay? We actually call uh, the measure of how fast and how much energy these have temperature. That's what temperature is. It's the measure of how much, uh, how much kinetic energy, or how fast these little molecules are moving um, to measure the, that's what we call temperature. Okay? And have you guys ever heard of uh, absolute zero temperature? Absolute zero is more or less when the molecules stop moving. That's why you can't go below absolute zero. How can you have a molecule be less than moving? It's either stopped or moving, right? It can't be not, it can't be under moving, if that makes any sense. Okay? Okay? Pressure versus density. If you have an inflated tire, this is kind of a, a, a weird look at a tire, but see how this is the bottom of your tire and the tire would actually come around in a circle? Okay? If you look at the tire, the air pressure and air density in the inflated tire are greater than the pressure from outside, which makes sense because you want it to stay inflated, right? If you have twice as many molecules in the same amount of space, you get twice as much density. Okay? If you have the same temperature molecules, okay, if you're, then you double the amount of collisions, you have double the amount of pressure. How do you double the amount of collisions? Well, you put twice as much molecules in there. Therefore, they double the amount of collisions. Okay? You can tell on the little scale that not much pressure, more pressure. You know those little scales you have when you go to your, do your tire and it like pushes the little thing out? It's all because of the, the pressure in there, obviously, but those are not notoriously terrible. <laughs> I think they're not very, not very uh, accurate, supposedly. But I don't know what is more accurate, but that's why they're like $2 each. Yeah. They give them away for free. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> you can double the density of a, li of a gas. By the way, you can't really double the density of a liquid because liquids are incompressible. You can't squash liquids very well. Okay? It's hard to squash a liquid. You can press it. Ever when the bottle of water is full, if the bottle, nah, yeah. this one's empty, right? And you can easily do that to the air. You're just press, you know, changing the, the amount of pressure in there by squeezing the air. Try to do that when the bottle is full. You'd be like, oh, you know? Well, it's got to be 100% full because otherwise you just squeeze the air at the top. And there's a little air at the top there, but it's hard once you get to squeeze too much, right? And if you filled it way up to the top and then cranked that down, you wouldn't be able to squeeze it at all. It's like hydraulics. It's like hydraulics. That's a very good point. When you, so uh, Tyler has obviously changed the brakes in his car or the clutch or something like that, no? Or you just knew? I read it in a book. I read it in a book. <laughs> when you do that, sometimes you introduce air into the brake line. And that's bad, bad, bad news because the brake line works by hydraulics, which we're going to talk about if not today, then next time. Um, when you press on the brake pedal, it compresses liquid, and it tries to compress liquid, and then that transmits through to the brakes themselves, squishes them together. If there's air in there, you press on the brake, and the air gets compressed and never transmits that pressure to the brakes themselves, and you're done. It's the same thing with refrigeration systems. Refrigeration systems, same thing. You've got you to gotta watch that. Um, you have to bleed them as well. So you bleed out of that, you, you get it so the bubbles go out of the system. And the air is not compressible. The air is compressible, right? You turn the, you, you make sure that's out. So if you want to double the amount of the pressure, you can either put twice as much air in there, or you can make the volume go just to half by pushing down on it with, say, a piston of some sort. Kind of cool. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. Boyle's Law, I'm, I'm going to, let's see. Boyle's Law is pretty simple. It basically says, the more you press down, uh, the, the, the pressure, it, it says the pressure times the volume is constant. So if you make the pressure twice as much and the volume half as much, you get the same amount of pressure. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're, we've got an example. I'm not going to worry about that right now. There's another principle called Pascal's principle. This is the interesting one. Pascal's principle, same Pascal as before, by the way, 
says that if you have a certain pressure on one place in a closed system like this, a closed, enclosed fluid, that pressure gets transmitted to the entire system. Every little piece of the system gets the same amount of pressure, including this side. Not so interesting here. When you have the same pressure here and here, who cares? Does matter when you do something like this. If you have a tiny little area here, and you put a 10 kilogram weight on it there, that pressure from that weight gets pushed to the entire system. And with much more area, you actually have the same pressure. You can hold up a much bigger object. Aha. For the small area, you only need a tiny little object. You can hold up a giant object if you make the area different. Now, you're not getting something for free here. What happens is if you want to move this up, say, one meter, you have to move this down, well, like 50 meters. You have to push this down 50 meters to get one meter up here. So it's a trade-off, but it's a very cool trade-off. If you've ever changed the tire in your car, okay, yeah, you can the 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 jack that comes to your car is one of those ones, yeah, it's a little scissor thing and whatever, right? It takes forever to use. Okay, it's kind of a pain. It works, but it's kind of a pain, right? It does the job. If you go and spend 15 bucks at AutoZone, you can get a hydraulic jack, which is about this big. It's a tiny little thing. It's got a little lever on it, right? And it's got a tiny little little post at the top, and then you just go up and down, right? And the jack goes right up. And it's pretty easy to do. Now, it takes a whole bunch of up and downs to get that tire to go up the foot you need or what half foot off the ground. But you get the benefit of you're over here and your tire or your car is over here. And you only have to do a tiny little force, lots of times, but a tiny little force to raise up the tire okay, or the car. So you see how that, that's all based on hydraulics. Everything you see, that, that giant machine that lifts up clues, have you seen that thing? Yeah. It's amazing. It's, a, it's, it's like every so often, T-Rex, yeah. I see that every so often. I'm like, oh, it's following me. Right? It'll pick up a clue and like move it around. Right? It's huge. Totally bases all of its like, lifting stuff on this exact principle right here, okay? hydraulics. Otherwise, it would never be able to lift anything. They should go around the liquid clue and drain them out. They what? They, they, they should. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know why this is, again, the balloons here. But Archimedes principle, fluids, liquids, and gases, and buoyancy. OK, I tell you what. Uh, there's a few more slides here that I'm not going to worry about. There's a cool, definitely read in your book about Bernoulli's principle, because it's kind of cool. It's all about flow and water. And you might have heard about that from another thing. But Bernoulli's principle is cool. Um, OK, I don't know if the computer is going to work to set it on. Sat Friday, no, Saturday is the next class? Saturday, the homework is due. So if you can't log on, I'm gonna, I can check, by the way. So I will email you individually if I see that by tomorrow you haven't logged on. Log on and try the homework. Don't stress about the units. Do the best you can and answer the questions. If you can't figure the units out, don't worry about it. I was going to try to log on, but I don't think it will work right now. And I don't want to keep you. Um, three days in a row is kind of a lot of physics, isn't it? Or a lot of science. Whew. Good job. We made it through a week and a day. All right. Any questions so far? What no? What are we going to read it for Saturday? Six. Chapters six and, six and seven. Start reading tomorrow during work. <laughs> Whenever you want. Like 30 pages a day, you'll be fine. Or 20 pages a day, you'll be fine. OK? Saturday, six and seven. I might have a little quiz, which is going to be harder than what the names of the chapter was. OK? The other thing that's due Saturday is the homework itself. And that's it. No project, even though the syllabus did say project. Just the homeworks that you've got online and the uh, and the reading. So we have to print it out? Nope. Just leave it. Leave it online. You can do it online. And in, okay. If you don't have a computer to use, talk to me and we'll figure out. You can either go to the University of Maryland Center and use the computer there after work, or may, you can probably use your work computer after work hours. Yeah. Does that make sense? You allowed to do that for this stuff? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah? Would I be able to print out the questions and then do them by hand? Oh yeah, if you want for, to for, for this time, but but I, every time I'd rather you just I'd rather you just get the book, but because you're gonna have to read it anyway, right? Who are you sharing with, Andy? James. James. Who's got the book right now? Yes. See, you can't read tomorrow. So he, they, he and it might be wet, cause his clue's wet. What's that? You cannot log on to this man. Right. So yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Right. You know what? Talk to Christian. Talk to Christian. He may be able to give you that. I don't know. Okay. I am going to try. I'll try to log on here for anybody who wants. Could you clip that off one?